In the Senate of the United States, a resolution to establish a select committee of the Senate to conduct an investigation and study of the extent, if any, to which illegal, improper, or unethical activities were engaged in by any persons acting individually or in combination with others in the presidential election of 1972 or any campaign, canvas, or other activity related to it. From Washington, NPAC brings you gavel-to-gavel videotape coverage of today's hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here is NPAC senior correspondent Robert McNeil. Good evening. This was one of the most fascinating days in seven weeks of Watergate hearings. The reputed superman of the Nixon White House, Bob Haldeman, came on like mild-mannered Clark Kent and then casually dropped sensational news. President Nixon has let him listen to two of the White House tapes that the Irvin Committee and the federal prosecutor are desperate to get their hands on. Moreover, Mr. Haldeman listened to one of the recordings just a few days ago, long after he left the government, and he took the tape home to do so. Mr. Haldeman's account of what is on the tapes of two important meetings is largely what John Dean said it was, but Haldeman says Dean put entirely the wrong interpretation on it. This dramatic development shocked the committee out of its obvious exhaustion and equally obvious internal animosities. During the last hours of John Ehrlichman's five-day appearance, there was evidence of open bitterness and partisanship, but all was smoothed over in a session at the end today when the disputants said something nice about each other. Ehrlichman said after his testimony that he has no fear of being indicted because, as he put it, I've done nothing wrong. Impact's Peter Kay asked him for an, an evaluation of his testimony as Ehrlichman left the hearing room. How do you think you did? How do I think I did? Yeah, as a witness. Well, uh, uh, that, that, of course, is a question of what your goals were. Uh, my goals were to tell what I knew about a list of subjects. And if you remember in my opening statement, I laid that list out as plainly as I could. And I've been keeping tabs as we went along every day and checking off the subjects as we got through them. And by George, we got through the next to the last one about 20 minutes before the end. So I felt pretty good that we had covered the ground. That was my principal concern, that we cover the ground and, we, and that I get an opportunity to fully uh, develop the facts as I recall them and, or have been able to learn them from research. The committee decided today to push on and finish the Watergate phase of its public inquiry before taking a summer vacation. This means no adjournment this Friday and six more witnesses after Haldeman. Former FBI Director L. Patrick Gray, Deputy CIA Director Vernon Walters, the former number one and number two men at CIA, Richard Helms and General Robert Cushman, former Attorney General Richard Kleindienst, and Assistant Attorney General Henry Peterson. In order to get through all of these people as quickly as possible, the committee is adopting a faster game plan. It will hang in there later in the afternoon, start 30 minutes earlier in the morning, take shorter lunch breaks, try to keep going through Senate votes, and most importantly, impose a 10-minute time rule for each senator's round of questions. The plan would, would then be to try to wrap up things by a week from Friday, August the 10th. We shall see about that. For the record, the vote on the decision to keep going was the committee's first 4-3 to three vote, with Senators Irvin, Baker, and Montoya on the losing side. Tonight's playback is one of our longest and probably one of the most important in 33 days of testimony. To help you chart a course through the words of John Ehrlichman and H.R. Haldeman, here is NPAC's hour-by-hour -hour viewing guide. In hour number one, John Ehrlichman says he didn't immediately inform the president of the Ellsberg break-in because once it occurred, there was nothing the president could do. Asked about his exit from the White House, Ehrlichman said it was due to appearance problems because he had no legal liability. In the second hour, Ehrlichman has asked if he knew the president had been told that national security burglaries were illegal. He says no, and he characterized as perfectly silly the allegation he ordered Patrick Gray to destroy documents. In hour number three, Ehrlichman testifies that Charles Colson was on hand when plans were made to open Howard Hunt's safe. When confronted with conflicting testimony from Colson, Ehrlichman still maintained that Colson was there. And in that hour, he says a call to John Dean, requesting him to stand firm on the Hunt files given to Gray, did not amount to a cover-up. In the fourth hour, Ehrlichman labeled John Dean's version about offers of executive clemency nonsense, saying they never took place. And in his closing statement, Ehrlichman took issue with Gordon Strawn's advice to young people. He challenged young people to come to Washington and do better. In the fifth hour, H.R. Haldeman begins his statement. 
saying that a 1970 domestic spy plan was approved but was withdrawn and never went into effect. He said that Donald Segretti's dirty tricks operation, as originally conceived, contained nothing wrong. In the sixth hour, Haldeman denied that he ever ordered Strawn to clean his files. And in that hour, he admits he listened to the president's tape of the September 15th meeting with John Dean. In the seventh hour, Haldeman reveals that he obtained the tape of the March 21st Dean meeting with the president and played it at home. Also in that hour, he says that Dean's conflicting dates about when he discussed clemency with the president was a genuine confusion. Now to the hearings that Senator Irvin opened today with a lecture to the audience on decorum. I have on, I have on a number of occasions requested the audience to refrain from any action which indicates approval or disapproval of anybody or of any question or any answer. And I'm going to have to, much with much reluctance, it uh, does not assist the committee for people to demonstrate, and I'm going to have to instruct the, the officers to eject from the hearing room anybody who engages in any demonstration in the future. During the examination of uh, Secretary Stans, he was asked certain questions with reference to the existence of a fund in uh, the Department of Commerce. While he was Secretary, he denied the existence of such a fund. And I have received a letter from his attorneys, this letter, July the 27, 1973, this letter is another appeal to your committee to act in a spirit of fairness which requires the clearing up of the misleading record made during the appearance of Honorable Morris H. Stans on June 12, 1973, over nationwide television. I addressed a hand-delivered letter to you on July the 5th, 1973, together with enclosures, copies are attached. As noted in that letter, even though Mr. Stans denied that he had ever seen the Magruder memo copy attached, and stated that no, there was no such political fund in the Department of Commerce, the media, based upon your hearing record, erroneously referred to a million-dollar secret fund which, in fact, did not exist. In addition to the letter from Richard Whitney and two affidavits from former Secretary of Commerce for Administration, Larry A. Job, furnished earlier, we enclose herewith another affidavit from Joseph E. Casson, former executive assistant to Mr. Stans at Commerce, stating that he had advised Mr. Magruder's office that no such political fund existed or was contemplated. Moreover, Mr. Casson has told me that he never discussed the fund inquiries with Mr. Stans and that no one else did in his presence. It is abundantly clear that Mr. Stans has never seen the Magruder memo prior to his testimony and that there was no such political fund. If he had been asked about the memo in staff interviews, he could have clarified the matter. That was not done, however. Mr. Stans was asked to identify a memo he had never seen. Later, your committee had Mr. Magruder affirm he had written the memo but did not pursue any facts of the non-existent political fund. As a result, the public has been mis misled by Mr. to Mr. Stans' damage and embarrassment. Feeling that the only way to correct this matter, apparently, is a clarified statement in your public and televised hearing we suggested to staff counsel that the record be cleared up without delay in accordance with the enclosures. See proposed statement first on July 11, 1973. We again request this action to be taken without further delay. Pursuant to this request, rather, there's a great many documents that would take a long time to read over TV, but they state in effect exactly what Mr. Stans testified namely that there was no such uh, political fund in his department. He stated that very positively. I, of course, don't know what the news media, he also stated at that time, 
that uh, the testimony corroborated uh, the testimony of Mr. Sloan to the effect that there was a uh, one million dollars which had been spent out of funds kept in safes in uh, the offices of the committee, and I don't know what the, the news media referred to, but. Uh, in uh, an effort to be fair to uh, Mr. Stans, who positively denied the existence of any such fund when he testified. I it will assert in the record without objection on the part of any member of the committee a letter, uh, a letter from uh, his, uh, Mr. Stans' his attorney dated July the 5th, 1973. A letter from uh, Richard P. Whitney a copy of a letter from Richard P. Whitney to Mr. David Dorson of the committee staff, dated June the 25th, 1973. A letter from uh, a, a verified letter from Mr. Larry A. Job to the chairman of the committee, dated June the 18th, 1973. A letter from Mr. Larry A. Job to Mr. David Dawson, dated June the 25th, 9th, 1973, and a certain uh, exhibits attached there to, and a statement from Mr. Larry A. Job, dated uh, to Secretary Stans, dated January the 19th, 1972. And a copy of uh, the Magruder statement uh, uh, next to that letter, July the 28th, 1972, in the form of a confidential memorandum for the Attorney General, and an affidavit by, Mr. by Joseph E. Hassan, dated the 23rd day of July, 1973. And a statement for the record, which was received by the committee on July the 27th, 1973. All of these will be admitted in the record, and I will state, I will state on behalf of the committee that these are documents which tend to, uh, to corroborate Mr. Stanza's testimony that there was no political fund in the, the uh, Department of Commerce while he was secretary of that department. And I trust that this clarifies the situation sufficiently. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, two uh, short matters which are the result of weekend research but go to questions which were asked on Friday near the close of the session. I wonder if I might be permitted to uh, supplement the record. Yes. The first has to do with the question of the propriety of the manner in which Mr. Stanza's testimony was presented to the grand jury. Uh, it appears that this question has been decided by the United States Court of Appeals in the Second Circuit in a recent case involving alleged corruption in the office of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. It's the case of United States versus Swag. And in that case, Swag, who was the uh, uh, Speaker McCormick's administrative assistant, which was charged with accepting bribes or, or uh, committing other illegalities as administrative assistant. Representative McCormick, a Democrat of Massachusetts, was asked to give his testimony to the grand jury. And the, the uh, testimony was taken, uh, not by personal appearance before the grand jury, but by three assistant United States attorneys coming to his office on two occasions. On one of those occasions, uh, taking his testimony in the presence of Mr. McCormick's nephew, an outsider to the proceeding. The defendant in the case appealed to the United States Court of Appeals, uh, stating very much the same kind of objection that was stated here to the procedure. Uh, in 441 Fed Second at page 114, the court approved the taking of Speaker McCormick's testimony for grand jury use uh, by this process. 
I will look in that decision. I have looked in the federal statute. I can find no statute which warrants the taking outside of the presence of a grand jury of the statement of any witness for presentation to a grand jury where that witness is available, is able-bodied, and is available to the grand jury. You, and uh, I don't, I would, uh, so far as I've found, but I will uh, look into that case and see if, if it reveals any such. You, you and Mr. Swag read the statute the same way, but the, the Second Circuit disagreed with it. Well, I think, I think that's a different principle. When you get on the trial of a case, the court does not undertake, the trial court does not undertake to review what kind of uh, testimony was presented before the grand jury. Well, Mr. Chairman, could I ask for the citation yes, of the sir. case again? Yes, It's 114 Federal, er, pardon me, 441 Federal Second at page 114. What, and that was from the U.S. Second Circuit Second Court Circuit, of Appeals? Second yes, Circuit, 414? At, at page 114. 441 <laughs> Fed Second at 114. Thank you. Very and much. I might it's a 1971 for, case. And I might state for the purpose of shedding further light on this subject, I request the staff of the committee to communicate with the Department of Justice and with the United States District Attorney for the District of Columbia and with the assistant district attorneys who had actual charge of the prosecution of the case and with the special prosecutor and ask them to punish to this committee a copy of the statement made by Secretary Stans in the Department of Justice to the prosecuting attorneys. That would clearly be admissible either to corroborate or to contradict Secretary Stans, and it would not fall within the, immunity, the, the exemption provision of testimony before the grand jury because it would be a statement made before third parties. And I ask the staff to ask that. M Mr. Chairman, the other matter that I have... Before you go on, Mr. Erlewine, do I understand, Mr. Chairman, that you're asking for a copy of the statement made by Mr. Stans the U.S. attorneys that was subsequently submitted to the grand jury? I don't know whether it was submitted to the grand jury or not. Oh. I, I don't know what was submitted to the grand jury, and I have no way to find out. Or, uh, do we make a distinction between what was and yes. was not submitted? Yes. Thank you. In other words, all I want is a statement that was made to the, in the presence of the uh, uh, prosecuting attorneys. I don't want anything that happened before the grand jury. Mr. Chairman. I was not entitled to it. The other, the other matter I have was in, in supplement to my answer to Senator Montoya on the subject of tax returns. Uh, I've been provided with a copy of the Congressional Record for April 16, 1970, pages 5911 to 5924, uh, which is a uh, colloquy bringing forth contrasting procedures under the Kennedy administration and the Nixon administration with regard to White House access to uh, income tax returns and other tax records. It appears that the uh, uh, regulations uh, which the Nixon administration imposed upon such access were a novelty. They had not been in, in effect before. They required requests in writing, and they enumerate the number of such, <coughs> pardon me, such White House requests up to this 1970 date um, and it's a total of nine requests. I would point out to the committee also the practice under the Kennedy administration where six days after inauguration, Mr. Bellino, special consultant to the president, called on the Commissioner of Internal Revenue and uh, uh, undertook inspection of many, many tax returns for days at a time. Um, there's an extensive uh, description of Mr. Bellino's examination of the tax returns of various individuals for, quote, days on end, unquote, at page 5913. Um, did uh, President uh, Nixon at any time, between uh, the time that the break-in of the Democratic headquarters in the Walter Cape became public knowledge, down to the 21st uh, day of March, 1973, ask you to ascertain for his enlightenment how it happened that uh, the burglars caught it, some of the burglars caught in the Watergate had uh, funds in their pockets which uh, came from the committee to re-elect the president? Ask me to personally ascertain yes. that, Mr. Chairman. He did not ask me to personally involve myself in any 
inquiry or investigation in this matter until March 30th. He did ask me, and the only request of me that might bear on this was a request he made to me about the 6th of July, a matter of three weeks after the break-in, where he asked me to direct Pat Gray, the director of the FBI, to make an unlimited investigation and to take no instructions from anyone as to the scope of the investigation. But Mr. Gray alone was to determine that scope, and I did convey those instructions to Mr. Gray. Now, I may be wrong, but I construed your testimony that the President asked you to see General, talk to General Walters about funds that had been sent into Mexico. Not specifically, no, sir. Well, those funds mentioned by you to General Walters? Those funds were mentioned in the meeting, and I can't recall who raised the question, but that circumstance, not the funds themselves, but the circumstance of there being a Mexican source of money somehow came up in the meeting by one of the participants using that as an example of the kind of thing which might involve a CIA activity. Well, did you not later learn that those funds found their way into the bank account of Bernard L. Barton? Sir, as I understand it, the CIA, about six days later, determined that there was no connection with any CIA activity, and they so informed the FBI on the 29th, I believe it was, and that letter of July 6th between the CIA and the FBI gives the date, but I think it was about six days later the CIA told the FBI there was no so-called Mexican connection. Yeah, that's not an answer to my question. I asked my question was, if you didn't ascertain after that time that those Mexican funds had found their way, at least temporarily, into the bank account of Bernard L. Barton, one of the burglars caught in Watergate? Well, I didn't have any special knowledge. I believe I read that in the newspaper, Mr. Chairman. And you also found out that some of those funds that were withdrawn from the Barton bank account were the funds in the pockets in the bedrooms of the burglars. There again, I believe I read that in the press. Didn't that suggest to your mind that there was something rotten in the committee to re-elect the president? Certainly. And that was way back in the summer of 1972? At just about the time that we knew the FBI was all out in its investigation of this matter. Senator Baker, I might state that having finished myself, I'm going to impose a 10-minute rule on those minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'll expedite your 10-minute rule somewhat by saying that Mr. Ehrlichman's been on the stand now for his fifth day. We've covered a great amount of testimony. I'm sure there are other questions that would occur to all of us where we permitted now, after a recess, to go over the transcript and derive and suggest new lines of inquiry. I think, however, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, that I'm going to forego any further questions with the full understanding, Mr. Ehrlichman, that if there are other matters, particularly with so-called Phase 2 or Phase 3 of this operation, of this inquiry, having to do with the alleged dirty tricks operation or more in detail about the financial transactions, that I understand you, as other witnesses, would be willing to return and to testify further on that or any other subject. I would, Senator. I don't believe that I would have a great deal of information on either of those phases to assist you with, but I'm happy to be available. The only point I'm trying to make is if we forego questions now, it does not imply that we cannot ask you questions later. Mr. Wilson handed a copy of the congressional record dealing with income tax practices during the Kennedy and Nixon administrations. Was it your wish that that be examined by the committee or made part of the record, or what was the purpose of the— I just thought it would be made part of the record, but if anybody wants to ask any questions about it or make any statements, it's a very long statement. And relating— Very long colloquy, rather. It's your contention that it relates to the testimony of the witness, Mr. Ehrlichman, in response to the queries put largely by Senator Montoya on the examination of income tax returns. That's the purpose of it, sir. Mr. Chairman, if there's no objection, I would like to see the document identified for the record and accepted for that purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Ehrlichman. Thank you, Mr. Wilson.
I have no questions, Mr. Chief. The, the uh, document will be identified for the record and received as an exhibit. Senator Talmadge, or Senator Inouye, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ehrlichman, may we uh, now study your April 13, 1973, CC plus Shapiro interview note? Yes, sir. I'll get get my copy. Right, sir. Will you please proceed, sir? And on the first line, executive privilege, I believe it says. Yes. Uh, this, uh, I, I should say that, that this meeting was held primarily at Mr. Colson's request at the end of the day on the, on the 13th of April. The first thing that he said was that he had some, some um, uh, suggestions and points of view that uh, uh, he would like to have conveyed to the president. And that was the purpose, of the, the purpose of the meeting. But I also conceived of it as some opportunity to develop uh, additional information uh, because I was in the course of this inquiry. That first line refers to uh, R.K. being Richard Kleindienst's uh, statement to the Congress about executive privilege. And he simply noted that it had the Hill up in arms. And you please proceed, sir. Then he said that uh, Mr. Hunt, at 2 p.m. on the, the uh, coming Monday, uh, would once again be testifying, both from the standpoint of hearsay and firsthand. Uh, he said his, his sources were both within the government and Mr. Bittman, uh, Mr. Uh, Hunt's attorneys. He would testify that funds had traveled um, What funds are we talking about? Well, uh, we're talking about these funds for the defendants uh, in, the, in the criminal case. The funds from Parkinson and o uh, traveled from Parkinson and O'Brien uh, to Hunt to the Cubans and uh, on other occasion from O'Brien to Hunt to Mrs. Hunt. And I have down the sum of ten thousand dollars in the latter in the latter category. Uh, he said all of this um, uh, transmittal of funds information will be coming out. Then he said, uh, with relation to Mr. McCord, uh, as I recall, the setting of this was that McCord was coming up with all sorts of wild stories. Uh, his latest story was that uh, uh, Hunt and McCord, and he didn't know whether Liddy or, had been involved in this or not had made a trip to Las Vegas, uh, with an, uh, they landed, they had an airplane standing by, uh, they were going to uh, break into the safe of Hank Greenspun, who was a publisher in Las Vegas, and that um, uh, McCord was uh, saying that this was a, uh, a maneuver uh, masterminded by Charles Colson. Mr. Colson vehemently denied that he had any knowledge or uh, acquaintanceship with such a maneuver uh, or that he had anything to do with it. And he cited this simply as an example of the far out kinds of allegations that McCord was making at that time. I said, well, where does such a thing all fit in this whole, in this whole Watergate business? And he said, well, I don't think that it does fit in McCord's mind that it was some kind of a Howard Hughes operation, allegedly. Now, uh, this uh, uh, Senator, I hasten to point out is rankest kind of hearsay, and, and I don't assert the truth of any of this, but I, I'm simply describing what Mr. Colson was describing as Mr. McCord's rather extreme charges at that point. Uh, then he went on to tell another, uh, another version of the inception of the Watergate, which he termed Liddy hearsay, which was to the effect that Howard Hunt opposed the Watergate break-in, uh, the, the second break-in, uh, that uh, Hunt characterized it as stupid, 
uh, that Liddy told Hunt that it could not be called off, that Mr. Mitchell had ordered it, and that it must go ahead. Now, here again, Senator, I don't vouch for any of the reliability of that, but that's simply uh, hearsay, second or third hand. Uh, Mr. Colson said he was also picking up the rumor uh, that Mr. Mitchell had a, quote, blood oath, unquote, uh, to Mr. Liddy, that there would be a presidential pardon for Mr. Liddy. Uh, he said that he thought that uh, there was a possibility of Liddy corroborating McCord, or pardon me, of Hunt corroborating McCord, uh, and, and you would have a situation of uh, two people testifying to hearsay, or so-called double hearsay. He then reported to me on information that they were hearing, and again, this is in the rumor stage, about two grand juries who were investigating Mr. Mitchell. Uh, in addition to the New York grand jury looking into the VESCO matter, that there was a second grand jury in Washington, D.C., which uh, was looking into uh, money which passed from a man named Klein to Mr. Mitchell in consideration of government contracts for Klein. Uh, I do feel compelled to break in. Uh, I discussed this matter with uh, Mr. Hunley, Mr. Mitchell's attorney, and note for the record, uh, in response to a question, Mr. Ehrlichman has now mentioned the, the Vesco grand jury in New York. Uh, he's touching upon another matter that is completely unrelated uh, to this hearing. And uh, I would urge the chairman to rule at this time that there should not be any more evidence taken about this April 13th meeting. <laughs> this committee agreed at the start, as I understand it, at least agreed when Mr. Mitchell was here and also when Mr. Stans was here that we would not go into the Vesco matter. Simply out of while the committee undoubtedly has authority to investigate uh, all uh, campaign contributions, the committee unanimously failed, felt that out of fairness to uh, the uh, uh, Secretary Stans and Mr. Mitchell, and in view of the fact that there was an indictment pending about this, that we ought to refrain from going into it, and I would therefore request that uh, you omit any record, any uh, statement in regard to the Vesco matter. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, may I say that I entirely agree with you. I, it, it really is probably not a matter of law, but it's a sense of fair play that would indicate that when there is a criminal case pending, when there is an indictment, when there is a trial impending, that uh, not only the witness who may be the named defendant in that case ought not to have to testify on that subject, but I think other witnesses should be cautioned to avoid it as well. I think the statement is well taken, and I, I commend you for, uh, for urging that precaution in the interest of fairness. Thank you very much. And uh, without objection, the committee will strike from the record any testimony thus far given in reference to the best goal matter. Mr. Chairman, I might, might say for myself, I don't feel comfortable about purveying second and third hand hearsay. Yeah. And a great deal of this I cannot, I cannot assert to be true, uh, but it's simply my notes of a meeting and what someone else asserted to me. Yes, I think that it's unfortunate that uh, all of those of us who are interrogating witnesses do not confine our questions to the elicit from the witness what he has personal knowledge of. or in reference to statements made by parties involved to him. But unfortunately, it seems impossible to, to enforce that kind of rule in, in congressional hearings. If I may skip then down to the name Mardian toward the bottom of that page. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in view of the possibility that the rest of this interview might inadvertently touch upon the Vesco trial, uh, I'd like to uh, forego any inquiry at this time and go into something else. Senator, could I just put one matter in perspective on the last page of these notes? Somehow or another, these notes have appeared in the press, and uh, there are a number of adjectives found on the last page which have been speculated about in the press very unfairly to Mr. Mitchell. Uh, and uh, I, I wish, if I may, simply to make clear that these uh, six or seven references to Mr. Mitchell on the last page were Mr. Shapiro's uh, secondhand uh, characterization and did not in any way constitute an evaluation either by Mr. Colson or me of, um, of Mr. Mitchell either as an individual or as a potential witness. And um, I'm afraid some, some very 
cruel inferences have been uh, derived from this last page that uh, are, are uh, totally unjustified and unfair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, in the last four minutes remaining, I have a few questions here which may be a bit repetitious, but just for the record, sir. Did the president ever ask in your presence prior to March of this year for information on exactly how the Watergate break-in came about? Yes, sir. Uh, in this sense, that on repeated occasions, the president asked that a complete and definitive statement of the whole Watergate matter how it was planned, how it was executed, the whole picture be set down on paper and released. And uh, I have gone through my notes of meetings at which this subject was discussed and can say that on at least eight occasions, the President made that request. Did the president uh, ever receive satisfaction? No, sir. And I think the, the one of those uh, occasions uh, was just prior to his sending uh, John Dean to Camp David to set all this down in March of this year. But he asked Clark McGregor to do this back in, in September. Uh, he asked for a statement on a, on a narrow part of this on Segretti in November. Uh, in November, uh, later in the month, around Thanksgiving time, uh, he asked that, uh, in response to a letter that he had received from a friend about this, expressing real concern about it, he said that he wanted this out and cleaned up before the Congress came back, that a complete definitive statement out. He did the same thing again on December 8th, where he instructed John Dean to do a Watergate summary. Uh, he did the same thing on the 11th of December and said he wanted that statement by Christmas. Uh, again, he did it prior to our meeting in, uh, in La Costa on February 10th, and one of the major purposes of that meeting was to impress upon Mr. Dean the urgency for such a statement. Uh, he did it again in my presence in a conference with George Bush on the 20th of March, uh, and, and again uh, on the 22nd in this meeting that Mr. Mitchell and Dean and Haldeman and I had with the President where he said that he wanted John Dean to complete such a statement when by that When were you weekend. aware that the president asked Mr. McGregor for information? Sir? When did you become aware of the president's on, request on Mr. McGregor? On the 13th of September. Didn't you know at that time that Mr. McGregor didn't have any information to give? Well, the information had been given in Mr. McGregor's presence and in the president's presence uh, by the Attorney General, Mr. Kleindienst, on the previous day at which time Mr. Kleindienst assured the cabinet and Mr. McGregor and others assembled that, in point of fact, no one in the White House was involved, that the investigation had been extremely rigorous by the Department of Justice, that the seven persons responsible had, in fact, been indicted, and uh, he, he gave a, a total endorsement to the method of investigation and the results of that investigation. The, the President felt that there were ample facts available at that point for Mr. McGregor to do a definitive statement. How do you respond to Mr. McGregor's statement that he was, quote, lied to by you? Well, I think that, that what Mr. McGregor has done, I saw that in the, in the press over the weekend, Mr. McGregor has said, yes, they asked me to uh, make a statement back in, in uh, uh, July, August, and September. But I should have known about the CIA, and I should have known about the uh, special unit, and I should have known about other things that were happening in the White House. It seems to me that that, if, if I may say so, that's, that's an irrelevancy. Uh, in, in point of fact, uh, back in the uh, convention and immediately after the convention days and, and following up on the Attorney General's complete report on the 12th of September, to the President and Mr. McGregor and others, that Mr. McGregor was in an excellent position to have stepped out based upon very extensive Department of Justice investigation and made a, a full and complete statement of the facts as we all believed them at that time. Won't that have been repetitious? Didn't the Attorney General himself give the President a report? Yes, sir. Then why should uh, Mr. McGregor, who was just uh, listening in, give another report? Well, the thought here was that there should be two reports, one with regard to the White House and White House involvement, which in fact the President did give in August, 
But the other part of that, and the important part, was the involvement or non-involvement of various committee to re-elect personnel. And that was, the, that was the report which the President was pressing for from Mr. McGregor in September. My final question in this round, sir. Mr. Mitchell, in his testimony, suggested that he withheld information from the President. In fact, he lied to the President because he didn't want the lid to be blown off. Did you ever keep information away from the President or lie to the President? I've, I've certainly never lied to the President, Senator, or at least uh, I hope I never have. Uh, uh, certainly not, certainly not in, uh, uh, told him intentionally anything that was not true. Now, as far as keeping things from the President, a great deal of my time was spent in trying to evaluate what should and should not be considered uh, a matter for presidential attention. And certainly I did not indiscriminately just shovel everything that came on my desk uh, to the president. Uh, I, have, I have made dozens and I suppose hundreds of judgments uh, over the four years that matters of information and even matters of, for decision need not go to the president that uh, in, the, in the hierarchy of, or, or priority of, of uh, uh, how he should devote his time, that this was, a, uh, whatever it was, was a matter which uh, would needlessly occupy his attention or that could better be decided by someone else. And so I have, I have on literally hundreds of occasions uh, been involved in a, in a decision of that kind. Did you consider the break-in on Dr. Fielding's office important enough for presidential notification? I did not. That was not important. It was a it, it was an uh, an event. It had occurred. Uh, there wasn't anything that the president could do about it. Wasn't anything he was called upon to do about it. It was in a continuum of investigation. And I simply made the judgment that <clears throat> it would unnecessarily tax his attention uh, under, under circumstances that, that really it was something he could do nothing about. Didn't you consider the meetings uh, involving Mr. Liddy, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Dean, and the office of the Attorney General, and later in Key Biscayne, was important enough for presidential notification? Certainly. And I did notify him of that within an hour or two of having learned of it. When did you learn about this? I learned about that in my interview with Mr. O'Brien in Key Biscayne, or in uh, San Clemente in um, the early part of April of this year, on April the 5th. Didn't you know about this in June of 1972? No, sir. You mean to say you were kept in the dark until April of this year? Yes, sir. Mr. Strong never discussed this with you? No, indeed. Mr. Dean never discussed no. this with you? Mr. Haldeman never discussed this with no. you? Weren't you curious when uh, reports uh, were being made in the press about these meetings? When reports were being made in the press? Suggesting that these meetings had been held? Well, I think those reports, I don't know just when those reports appeared, Senator, but I don't think they were very much previous to my having talked to Mr. O'Brien here. I thank you very much, sir. Mr. Chairman, my periscope indicates that the Zweig opinion has been brought to you, and to save some time, it's the last footnote on the last page of the opinion. You don't have to read anything else. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was, in, I was in, uh, in, intrigued by this statement in the opinion in, those, in those requiring Swag to come before him. It says on page 121, indeed, in an investigation such as the grand jury was conducting here, the grand jury and the government would have been subject to proper criticism if the grand jury had failed to inv invite Swig's attendance as a witness. It is altogether in the public interest that grand juries should inquire with care and thoroughness before they file formal charges against anyone. Mr. Chairman, I might make a statement, if I may, since I indicated when I remarked on this situation 
on the previous examination of Mr. Ehrlichman that I, too, thought it was improper to conduct the hearings other than before the grand jury. I freely confess I was not aware of the case that you've now presented to me. And I also note that footnote 7 on page 121 lists some five or six other cases to the same effect, and that the Shepard citations compilation shows that in this case certiorari was denied by the U.S. Supreme Court, which, of course, has the effect of affirming the Second Circuit Court of Appeals decision. The operative language is footnote 7. It says, one such contention, that is, that the indictment was defective, is that the indictment should have been dismissed because the grand jury received testimony from Speaker McCormick in an unlawful way. Instead of calling McCormick to testify in person, the grand jury sent three assistant U.S. attorneys to interview him on two occasions, once in the presence of his nephew. And to make a long story short, the Court of Appeals held and the Supreme Court concurred, inferentially by denying certiorari, that that was an appropriate way to proceed. Now, the question still presented, I suppose, in which this committee ought to reserve, Mr. Chairman, is whether or not the test of inconvenience applied to Speaker McCormick would similarly be applied to the courts to Mr. Stans. And, of course, we do, or at least I do, reserve that question, but I thank counsel for the case. Just one other observation on that. When the Supreme Court denies cert, that is, the application for writ of certiorari, it makes no decision. It doesn't even express an opinion to rule in the lower court as to good or bad. Why is it foolish or sound or unsound? It just refuses to take the case. Now, it says here that Speaker McCormick was excused because it was difficult and inconvenient for him to come. That's not the testimony here. The testimony is that it was to spare him the humiliation of having to be confronted with the press. But this is beside the point that I was making. And the point that I'm making is, without regard to the good intentions of the President in requesting that Mr. Stans be excused from a personal appearance, and without regard to your action in communicating the President's request to Mr. Peterson, the fact is that in the absence of an opportunity to cross-examine Mr. Stans, the grand jury might have been denied evidence which would have justified the grand jury in considering whether there should be some indictment to return in respect to persons who were officers of the committee to re-elect the President. It goes to the wisdom of action. I'm not too much concerned about the legality. I think it's very unfortunate for all the President of the United States, from even the best of motives, to undertake to make a request which has the effect of obviating an ordinary feature of the judicial process, that is, the appearance of a witness before a grand jury, and according to the grand jury, an opportunity to cross-examine the witness. Mr. Chairman, I'd only say one more thing. I don't want to belabor this point, except to say that as far as I'm concerned, I indicated on the record the other day that I thought it was unlawful to do that. Now I find that it is at least arguably lawful to do that. It was in that particular factual situation when Speaker McCormick was not required to appear before the grand jury but gave his deposition. Now, I think the committee will reserve to the incoming of the report an evaluation of the wisdom or lack of wisdom of doing it that way, but I apologize, and that was the reason for my interjection to the witness and to Mr. Wilson for previously expressing my impression that that was an irregular procedure. Apparently that is not, on its face at least, an irregular procedure, and I have nothing further to say about it. I think it's irregular in the sense that it's not regular. And I think it's very unfortunate. We can maybe clear up the fact, we can clear up the matter if we ever get a statement of what he told the prosecuting attorneys, and I certainly agree with the senator from Tennessee that this is a matter to be weighed and considered by the committee later, and not on the spur of this moment. I was merely suggesting some misgivings of mine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have legal misgivings as well as notwithstanding the fact. My experience has been along the years of practicing law that I can find a federal decision in one of the 
circuits that will sustain any point on any side of any question. Yeah, but it's been my experience <laughs> practicing law, too, that when the Supreme Court denies certiorari, I'm out of business. Yeah, and so is the Supreme Court. Well, that's up to, that's up to them to decide. I, I, I've argued long and hard with them, and sometimes I won and sometimes I lost, and I like it better winning, but that's not always the way it goes. Oh, Senator Garney. Thank you. Mr. Ehrlichman, on April the 14th, you gave your report to the president on Watergate. And on April the 30th, you resigned from the White House staff. Now, in the two weeks in between, you had several meetings with the president of the United States. I presume some of these were on Watergate and conversations that led up to your resignation. Will you tell the committee what you said to the president and what the president said to you in the meeting? Senator, uh, notwithstanding Watergate, the business of the White House went on during those two weeks, and quite a few of these meetings were uh, with, reg with regard to the business at hand, and I'll leave I will understand, out. and I'm uh, not interested in that. Right. Only Watergate matters. Quite a bit of the conversation during this period of time had to do with uh, John Dean's status in the White House. Uh, Henry Peterson uh, became the president's um, uh, confidant and uh, uh, right-hand man on Watergate following the 15th of April. Uh, the president decided that he would work with Mr. Peterson personally. Uh, he did. He had a number of meetings with Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson gave him uh, a good deal of additional information, which I didn't have, and uh, uh, to which I'm not privy. Uh, one of the first things that Mr. Peterson apparently asked the president to do was fire Mr. Haldeman and me. Uh, when was that, do you know? Well, it must have been uh, very early in the game, uh, uh, shortly on or shortly after the 15th. Um, uh, uh, the president pressed him uh, for uh, the basis of this request. Mr. Peterson acknowledged that there probably was no legal liability, but that he felt that as a matter of appearances that uh, this is the step that the president should take. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Peterson was urging the president not to fire Mr. Dean until such time as the prosecutors had had an opportunity to perfect uh, their negotiations and their interrogation of Mr. Dean. And so uh, there was a lot of conversation uh, between us over this period of time, both as to what our status should be in the White House and what Mr. Dean's status should be. Uh, on Monday the 16th, I believe it was, the president telephoned me and said that he was going to see Mr. Dean that morning. He had decided that Mr. Peterson's uh, uh, desires to the contrary notwithstanding, he was going to request that, that Dean either take a leave or resign. Uh, he asked that uh, letters be prepared uh, that would be appropriate to both of these uh, uh, alternatives and he more or less dictated what should be in those letters. I say more or less, he, he literally did dictate what he, what he wanted in them. Um, I had my secretary type them basically from the notes that I took from that conversation with the president, and I understand that later on uh, he did present them to Mr. Dean. Mr. Dean refused to sign either one. So he reported that to me later on in the day. Uh, uh, there were those kinds of those kinds of questions that were going on uh, uh, in discussion. Uh, at a at a point in time, uh, he uh, asked Mr. Let's Peterson. stop right there. Did the president tell you why he wanted to fire Mr. Dean or have him resign? Well, he felt that that uh, since Mr. Dean was continuing to come to the uh, uh, come to the White House, and apparently. Um, had access to his files and to other files, presumably in the central files of the White House. Um, that it was a, it was, they had then a, basically an adversary relationship and that it was an, un, an unhealthy situation. That there ought to be a clean termination. Um, uh, this obviously did not take place. Uh, Mr. Peterson, I gather from talking with the president, I gather, uh, Mr. Peterson strongly urged the president following that to make no move where Mr. Dean was concerned. And uh, the president acquiesced in that. Uh, we became, uh, that is, uh, Mr. Haldeman and I, became uh, the targets of, of um, uh, newspaper uh, and other media 
attention about uh, the 22nd, about Easter, and uh, from then on through the 30th, um, the, uh, very uh, uh, vigorous um, uh, newspaper uh, attack is the only thing I can say. Um, uh, the Los Angeles Times printed a totally uh, dishonest and false story about my intervention on behalf of the Vesco people in some uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, activity. Uh, uh, there was, we were continually finding, uh, I was continually finding myself uh, uh, laying aside the work of the day to prepare press statements or to at, research at, documents or things of this kind. And what I'm leading to, Senator, is... Just a moment, but at that point, I think we should strike from the record, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I think we should strike from the record mention of this BESCO case. We're trying yes, to keep this out be of the, from the record. Well, it's a yeah, but I, I just want to state for the record that, uh, you, you know, the witness is being responsive. He's mentioned this case twice this morning. It just doesn't suffice for Mr. Mitchell's purposes every time it happens to strike it from the record. Well, uh, we are glad to have your objection about the BESCO matter, but I believe that's as far as we can go at this time. Uh, in any event, and I'll ask the witness. To, I'll be. To, I'm, I'm sorry. That was a. I had a, I had a personal Vesco. interest in yeah. that one. I'm afraid, Mr. No. Chairman, and and uh, it, this was the instance, however, that directly led to my realization that I simply could not do my job there and and uh, uh, continue uh, with with the uh, denials and the uh, harassment and all that was going on. We began discussing very seriously with the President the need uh, uh, for, uh, and, and this was separate, uh, I, I began discussing, and I understand Mr. Haldeman began discussing with the President, the need for, for a leave of absence about this point in time. And uh, as we progressed into this uh, week of the 23rd of April, uh, that was the subject that was under serious consideration, uh, alternatives, who could, who could pick up for me and, and carry on the domestic side, the work the, the policy questions, move the information to the President, and so on. And uh, by the time the President went to Camp David on, I think, the 27th, after we returned from Mississippi to uh, uh, Senator Stennis' uh, uh, ceremony in Mississippi, uh, uh, the, I think the President was settled in his own mind, and it was my impression from talking with him on the airplane that uh, he had settled in his own mind that, that uh, we should take a leave of absence at that point. Mr. Haldeman and I discussed this um, on the 28th, and uh, it was our mutual view at that point that uh, even the leave of absence thing would be misunderstood uh, and, and that uh, we should simply make a, a clean break of it. The President invited us to Camp David on the Sunday, the 29th. Uh, we separately discussed with the President our points of view on this at that time. Uh, we both had extended private meetings with him, and the upshot of that was that we submitted our resignation. And uh, in, in summary, between April the 14th and April the 30th, in these meetings where you discussed Watergate, it was mainly a discussion of, of how more and more you were becoming ineffective because of the, uh, the media exposure to Watergate, including you and also Mr. Haldeman. And those were principally the discussions that led up to the resignation? There were, there were other points, obviously, being raised. Mr. Peterson was pressing the contention, for instance, that uh, uh, I had urged Hunt to get out of the country and I had urged Mr. Dean to destroy the contents of the safe. And he was playing back to the President, in justification of his argument that we should be fired, a uh, uh, the, the, uh, testimony that, that was being uh, picked up by the prosecuting attorneys. So I, in turn, was uh, uh, trying to uh, gather such evidence as I could on those points. And as I said before, I talked to the people who were at the meeting of June 19th, and I reported to the President what they had said. Um, uh, likewise, during this period of time, we consulted counsel and uh, uh, laid out the facts for counsel and, and took his opinion uh, as to whether or not we were guilty of any legal wrongdoing and made that report to the President. So we were very much personally involved in uh, uh, trying to indicate to the President what our point of view was, our recollection of the facts, uh, where the truth of this matter lay. Let me put it this way. In any of these meetings, did the President <clears throat> say to you, uh, John, it's come to my attention that 
uh, you were involved in the cover-up in such and such a fashion, uh, and I can't keep you on because of that? Uh, did any of the conversations go in this vein? No, they, they went in the vein, um, uh, this, this fellow is making an accusation against you, being John Dean. Uh, these are serious allegations. Uh, I have confidence that what you're telling me is true, but let's face it. Uh, the prosecuting attorney, uh, uh, through Mr. Peterson, is strongly urging that I, that I put you on leave of absence, and I have to listen to that advice. Did the uh, president ask you to resign? No, sir. That, that's all, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time, I'm not going to take my full 10 minutes. Thank you. In a moment, Senators Montoya and Weicker will have their final questions for John Ehrlichman. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. As we go back to the hearing, Senator Montoya wants to know about recent charges from Clark McGregor, former director of the re-election no, committee. Mr. Montoya, I just have one question, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Uh, the other day, we brought out that uh, the president in two press conferences, the press conference of April 17th and the press conference of April 13, uh, 30th, 1973, had alluded to uh, the date of March 21st, which was the date, significant date in his mind, when he had really ordered uh, an intensive investigation. Then in your opening statement, you indicated that uh, you had been commissioned by the president to start an investigation or an inquiry, as you called it, uh, on March the 30th. Now, can you tell me what information was given to the president as a result of the intensive investigation which began on March the 21st and up to the time that you assumed your own inquiry on March the 30th? That was never uh, presented to me, Senator, in any sort of uh, uh, capsulized or organized form. Uh, in other words, uh, I didn't sit down with the president and, and uh, in a situation where he said to me, now, here's everything I've learned in the last nine days. Um, so, uh, but, but at the same time, in his reaction to uh, this narrative report, which uh, I gave him, uh, it was evident to me that he had information or impressions, at least, about this matter, which were independent of anything that I was advancing to him. Uh, so that, uh, and I know that during the time that I was working on this, uh, uh, on and after the 30th, that the President was not limiting his sources of information to uh, just what I told him. Uh, I said the other day that um, in this meeting of the, of the 22nd of March, the President must have been doing one of two things, either uh, uh, proceeding uh, without any information gained on the 21st, or else he was playing a very cool game and setting uh, traps for people. Uh, in my own mind, I'm convinced it was the latter, that uh, the President had picked up enough information to, to begin to get started on this, and that he was he was checking a lot of people through a lot of other people. I know, for instance, he had me checked on Bob Haldeman, and I'm sure he didn't tell Haldeman that I was doing that. Well, I assume that when he made the statement at the press conference, to wit, on March 21st, as a result of serious charges which came to my attention, some of which were publicly reported, I began intensive new inquiries into this whole matter. I uh, interpret uh, this statement to mean that he received serious ch uh, charges personally and also through the press. Are you aware of any communication by anyone to the president with respect to serious charges which came to his attention? Well, I've heard the testimony here that Mr. Dean had this conversation with him uh, on the 21st and that Mr. Haldeman was in some of that meeting. Uh, at the same time, uh, or right around this period of time, 
Uh, Mr. McCord, of course, was making charges both in the press and uh, through a letter to the, to the district judge. Uh, I assume that, that all of those are, are referred to in that statement, but I don't know. Well, you're, you're assuming that uh, he was referring partly to uh, the report which Mr. Dean had given him. I assume so, but I don't know that. All right. Now, why would not the president come out with this information and also the information which you imparted to him on April the 14th at his April 17th conference? Just say, this is everything that I know? The, what, what actually you had imparted to him and you indicated that you had really given him some very substantial information. Well, I, I think in, in going through the notes uh, here with, with Senator Inouye and, and, and your examination, you see that a lot of what I gave him was hearsay, once and twice removed. Uh, uh, I would have felt it very unwise and unfair if the President had simply uh, made a public statement of all of this hearsay at that point in time. Uh, uh, it would have uh, very unfairly raised uh, charges and inferences against people uh, that, that may ultimately prove to be totally false. So I think what it stands for, the whole thing stands for, Senator, is that the President was alerted, he began to move, that he needed a great deal in, uh, more information even on the 18th of April than, than he had uh, in order to say definitely this is what happened and this is what happened and this is what happened without being terribly unfair to innocent people. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ehrlichman, when uh, did the name of uh, Judge Byrne first arise to your knowledge as a possibility for the FBI directorship? I believe, uh, Senator, that his name was on the original list of prospects. Um, oh, I, I don't know when, uh, perhaps back as far as uh, shortly after Director Hoover's death. I'm not, I'm not sure, but it had always been one of the names uh, on a list of seven or eight names. And um, you indicated in my, to me in my questioning last Friday that around this period of time of the 7th, 8th of March, uh, there was a certain disenchantment as to Mr. Gray. Yes, sir. Would it be somewhere in around that period that other names were being considered? No, I don't believe, I don't believe as early as that. Uh, as the best of my recollection, other names were not really considered until about the time that the President went west, which would have been uh, about the, oh, the 20, no, about the, tw about the 30th of March. I could be wrong on this, but uh, uh, that's the first that I recall any, any serious discussion of alternatives. Well, in that testimony, let's just review certain facts. In the conversation, the taped telephone conversation between yourself and John Dean on March the 7th or 8th, and I'm quoting verbatim now, Ehrlichman, well, I think we ought to let him hang there, let him twist slowly, slowly in the wind. Dean, that's right. I was in with the boss this morning, and that's exactly where he was coming out. He said, I'm not sure that Gray's smart enough to run the Bureau the way he's handling himself. Now, when you were questioned about this last Friday, your response was, and I'm reading verbatim from the transcript, Mr. Ehrlichman, well, Senator, I think you will remember those confirmation hearings and the revelations of the manner in which Mr. Gray responded during the hearings, and I think it is fair to say that there was pretty general disenchantment in the manner in which he handled himself during that time. When I was looking at 
what I was looking at while you were reading was the various events that took place starting back around the first of the month in those hearings and climaxing on the 23rd of March with Mr. Gray saying that John Dean probably lied to the FBI and then late, later probably recanting that charge to Mr. Dean and admitting that it was an overstatement and so on. At this point in time, there was general disenchantment of Mr. Gray's conduct in the process of confirmation. There is not any question about it, period. Do you recall having an interview with the Chicago Tribune on the 28th of March? Yes. Well, let me go ahead and cite to you your responses in that interview. This, mind you, is on the 28th of March, some 20 days after your comments and Dean's comments. And I think they're also, the interview can be taken in the light of what you told this committee last Friday. Question. Would the President be unhappy if the Senate refused to confirm L. Patrick Gray as Federal Bureau of Investigation Director in light of the President's repudiation of Gray's offer of raw FBI files to the Senate Judiciary Committee and the subsequent incident in which Gray seemed to tacitly agree that John Dean might have lied to FBI agents? Answer. I don't think that the administration position on Mr. Gray is necessarily related to those two incidents. The President supports Mr. Gray's nomination enthusiastically and has from the beginning. As far as I know, there is no change. Question. Is there a backup appointment? No. No one else is under consideration at all. Question. The President made it a point to ask Ron Ziegler, parenthesis White House Press Secretary, to express his confidence in John Dean the other day. Was the absence of such an expression for Mr. Gray significant in any way? Answer, oh no, Ron I'm sure has expressed confidence in Mr. Gray, or he would if asked. I certainly do, and I know the President would want me to. Question, he's still the man for the job as far as you're concerned. Answer. Oh, sure. Now, Mr. Ehrlichman, specifically, I would like to know what the version is. Did the White House support Gray's nomination or not? We had supported Gray's nomination right up till the time it was withdrawn. Now, uh, Senator, I'm sure you realize that when a, when a nomination is still up here and still before the Senate, uh, we support that nomination right down the line. What I may say to John Dean privately, the the in-house disenchantment with that nomination certainly would never be reflected in statements to the press. Until the President decides that he's going to have to withdraw that nomination, then by George, uh, uh, we're, we're, going to root for the, we're going to root for the team. Or can we paraphrase it, or by George, we're going to lie to the press? We're, we're certainly not going to end the, indicate to the press our disenchantment. That's right. One last question. I just received this document, and I think it raises some interesting questions. I'm not done, and I don't want to impede the time of the committee, the necessary backgrounding on it, except as that I have the document in my hands, and now I'm going to read it to you, and I will show it to you. I don't know if we have a copy or not. Uh, it's from the White House, Washington. It's dated October 2nd. 1972 for John Dean and it is from John Ehrlichman and it has your initial E on your name there and I will show this I will show this to you. Do we have a copy of it? Yes. Would somebody please give to Mr. Ehrlichman a copy? The memorandum dated October 2nd, 1972, from the White House for John Dean. Herb Kambach, thinking ahead to the possibility of the matter of privilege being raised at some time or another, suggested that there should be a written retainer arrangement in existence in advance. He has written out this longhand draft. 
I'm sure you'll find the basic question of whether or not such a letter is advisable to be the first hurdle. If you think that one may be inadvisable, I would suggest you talk to Herb Direct. Otherwise, would you work on a revision, John D. Ehrlichman? Now, the draft which Mr. Kambach wrote out reads as follows. Dear Mr. Kambach, for your file, this letter is to confirm that you have been and are now acting as legal counsel to the White House on various assignments. In such capacity, as our legal counsel, we expect you to treat these matters as being entirely confidential. We consider all aspects of these assignments to be within the attorney-client privilege, and you are therefore precluded from making any disclosures with respect to these matters. Should you be requested to comment on any of your legal assignments in this regard, we instruct you to invoke the attorney-client privilege rather than respond. Now, this was uh, Mr. Kambach's draft, which uh, obviously you read and sent on to Mr. Dean for his comment and or uh, revision. This was October 2nd, 1972, when in effect an attorney-client privilege was trying to be set up uh, in advance. Uh, would you like to explain to this committee as to whether or not, number one, this didn't arouse any suspicions on your part? and why it is that we have to set up attorney-client privilege, uh, attorney-client relationships uh, uh, in order to exert the attorney-client privilege uh, in advance. Well, as you see from the covering memo, Senator, I'm simply transmitting from Mr. Kambach to Mr. Dean a suggestion of Mr. Kambach's. I don't relate it to any specific uh, incident or project at all. I can't, uh, uh, Mr. Kambach would come once every couple of months and, and call on me and we would go down a list of items and this was one that I recall he left with me at, at such a meeting. Said that he was concerned about the sort of the informality of his arrangement and uh, uh, he wasn't vouching for it being a terribly good idea. As you see by the covering memo, I wasn't at all sure whether it was advisable, and I referred it to John Dean. I'm not sure whatever became of this, whether there was any action taken on it or not. Well, all you say is that whether it's advisable is the first hurdle. Right, and I don't have it's a... Inadvisable, you know, talk to him direct, otherwise would you work on a revision? I had no, uh, I, at the time, I had no feel for whether this was a good idea or not. In other words, you felt this was merely an attempt of Mr. Kambach to formalize his relationships with the White House? That was my assumption, yes. I think that well, if you take it on its four corners, that's, that's what his handwritten draft says. And uh, uh, I was in no position to judge as to whether that was or was not appropriate under the circumstances. Well, the whole thrust of his memorandum is to set up this relationship in order that he doesn't have to make any disclosures. Is that correct? Well, as I say, I think that it had, it had the, basic, employment. the basic question, as far as I was concerned here, was not whether there was a relationship or not, but whether this was, a, whether this was an advisable thing for the White House to be doing with a, an attorney on the outside. Well, but it's your statement. This is your, this is your interpretation. Herb Kambach, thinking ahead to the possibility of a matter of privilege being raised at some time or another. This is what you're saying to John Dean. Right. Well, why would he be thinking ahead? I'm, obviously, I'm, I'm not in a position at this time, at the time I wrote this, to know what his thought was. As I said, that, that's something that I asked Dean to get into with Kambach Direct. I took myself out of it. And it, 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 it did not, in conjunction with other matters that you had discussed with Mr. Kambach, it has no relationship at all. It's just a matter of trying to formalize his employment status at the White House. Well, it may have been in connection with something that we discussed, but I wouldn't know. I have no further questions this time, Mr. Chairman. It could be. Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman, counsel uh, brings to my attention a, 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 an omission. Uh, Senator Montoya asked me a question about uh, Clark McGregor and uh, uh, his his uh, response to my testimony. There is in the committee staff's possession 
a, um, a, a dicta belt recording of a conversation which Mr. McGregor and I had, which bears on this point, and I would ask that that transcription simply be made a part of the record. Now, the, the evidence before this committee is that the only things Mr. Comback had done well, uh, in, in the connection of these matters was that he had raised money and uh, had the money transferred through Ulasowitz to the defendants and their counsel in the criminal action, and that he had uh, disbursed money to Segretti. Isn't this, uh, these documents that Senator Weicker called your attention to, susceptible of the interpretation that it was an effort to uh, cloak him with uh, a, a suspicious uh, pretense of having acted in the capacity of counsel so he might uh, invoke the attorney-client privilege? Well, uh, Senator, I think you're, you're, uh, the first part of your statement is exactly correct, that you're operating on very limited knowledge based on the little bit of evidence that you've had here about what Mr. Kambach did. He did a great many other things, some of which he did for the White House. Now, I don't conceive that money-raising effort to be for the White House, and this uh, uh, attorney-client privilege statement, or this uh, retainer statement, st uh, uh, attempts to identify his relationship to the White House, not to the committee to reelect. So I would think just the opposite would be true, and that this would relate to some of those things which he had done in connection with the uh, San Clemente property or uh, something, well, something well, that was germane to uh, a legitimate White House activity. Well, there wouldn't have been any necessity for right now to document to that effect. Well, I, I, I would respect hope anything he did as attorney for the, as a private attorney for the president. I never have heard any evidence here or heard it suggested that he was ever an attorney for the White House. I thought he was a personal attorney of the president. Well, I hope you'll take the opportunity to take that evidence well, so that you would have this in proper context. Well, in the interest of time, I will, uh, without, if there's no objection on the part of any senator, I'll put these two, have these two documents marked exhibit, put it in the record, and we can analyze uh, later what the purpose was. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I ask that this other uh, uh, document, this uh, uh, telephone transcript, also be included in the record, a conversation between Mr. McGregor and me? Without objection, Mr. Alder. Thank you, sir. The, um, uh, I, was, I have no further questions, Senator Baker. I have no further questions. Senator Norway. Senator Garner. No Senator Montoya. Senator Wyken. No further questions for some presenter under the uh, siege of the terms of the council. Mr. Erdogan. I'm going to be moving on very quickly to the main area of our inquiry, which is the Watergate and the cover-up. But I will just ask a couple questions to get back to the Ellsberg break-in and not getting into the break-in itself. And they will not get into the legal questions of legality of the break-in, but the um, sincerity of your statement that you felt it was legal. Now, the first question that I have to ask in that area, that isn't it a fact, Mr. Erfman, that this is the first time you have asserted publicly before any investigating body the claim that the break-in of Mr. Dr. Fielding's office was legal for national security? Well, I think, uh, unlike the other investigative bodies, uh, this one goes far beyond mere fact and gets into these associated questions. The other investigative bodies, as you, as you call them, have been um, uh, basically grand juries where uh, we've not gotten into questions of law nor, uh, for that matter, the, the surrounding uh, uh, and uh, sort of uh, collateral questions. Uh, so that I've never been called upon, I don't think, to uh, uh, in any way treat of that subject on any previous occasion. But you have spoken publicly on this subject, have you not, on the so-called Ellsberg break-in? Well, I don't, I don't know what you call speaking publicly. I've talked to the press. And you also appeared on Mike Wallace's yes. uh, program, yes, 60 I did. Minutes. I did. Uh, do you recall in that interview your statement that there was no way to condone no way to condone that action. Now, if, in fact, you believed at that time that it was legal and had a, as your attorney indicated, uh, the section of the code which gave symbolic basis for the legality, 
would you be saying there was no way to condone it? Well, I think you'll remember my testifying here, Mr. Dash, that at the, at the time that it was reported to me, I did not condone it. Uh, it, was, it was simply beyond my, beyond my contemplation that there would be a resort to that particular, uh, to the, to the break-in, in order to do this job that, that they were assigned to do, this investigation. But you have testified and spent quite a bit of your time testifying and answer the questions that the break-in was actually a, a legal act in the interest of national security, that uh, uh, taking your statement that you did not know in advance that that's what they would do, nevertheless, that you indicated that that was perfectly legal under the law in the interest of national security. I believe that's a, I, I believe that's a sound position. Now, did you also testify that you spoke to the president in March about it and that he also indicated to you that uh, he believed that national security required it or, and it was justified under national security? Yes, he did. Then if, if he did that in March, uh, you're aware of his May 22nd statement. Why would it be necessary for the president in his May 22nd statement to make a public apology, actually, and take personal responsibility for what he said was uh, illegal means that he was not made aware of in advance? Uh, and rather, would he not have stated, as president, if he thought that this was a legal act in the interest of national security, that all acts of the plumbers group were legal and in the interest of national security. Why, why, would he, why would he feel it necessary to apologize to the people of America and take responsibility and say he had no foreknowledge of any illegal means? Well, uh, you're asking the wrong person, Mr. Dash, to explain the President's statement of May 22nd. I was gone like three weeks at that point and had no part in the preparation of that statement. Well, uh, uh, my statement here with regard to my understanding of the law is not meant to speak for the president nor anyone except myself. Uh, this is uh, my view based on the advice of eminent counsel, and uh, I think it's a sound one. Well, when did you first get that view? You said based on advice of eminent counsel. Is it not true that you have recently been advised by counsel based on the statutes that have been provided for you that this was a legal act. Well, you, certainly. And certainly. that, therefore, I had no occasion to brief it uh, uh, until I left the White House, Mr. Dash. Oh, well, then you never really believed at the time or had any viewpoint uh, when the break-in took place that this was legal. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly had a, a viewpoint, and I certainly had a, a strong feeling of the propriety of the President's actions in attempting to plug these leaks and to that's not determine my question. well, yes, sir, that's not my question. Well, the question no, no, is the break Mr. Dash, are you going to interrupt my answers? No, I want you to answer my question. Well, and you've me, used the let me give my for making me. speeches throughout this hearing. Let me give my answer, and then if you don't feel it's responsive, why don't you point out to me how it's not? Would that be all right? Well, I hope you give a responsive answer. Well, I will do my very best. I understand. I understand your question to be whether or not I had a belief or impression that the thing that the President had assigned here in creating this special unit was legal and proper. And I, my answer to you is that I had a continuing impression that the charge given to Mr. Krogh on the, July, on the 24th of July was in all respects within the President's constitutional prerogatives. I had then a, a present impression at that time that this was well within the President's national security powers, and that has continued to be my impression forward. Now, since I left the White House and have retained counsel, obviously they have done some intensive briefing on this subject, and you have seen the fruits of that in the colloquy between the Chairman and Mr. Wilson. That's a much more refined and precise and substantiated uh, position on the law than I had any occasion to make prior to this time. I'm not, at this point, want to re-raise the legal arguments, because that's, that's not the issue I'm uh, questioning on. Uh, is it also true that you were totally ignorant, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, of the fact that actually the President and Mr. Haldeman had been informed that surreptitious entries or break-ins for national security purposes were clearly illegal and constituted the crime of burglary prior to that break-in? 
Were you ever aware of that? Well, if you're speaking of the Houston, the Tom Houston uh, memos, of course, the subject there was an entirely different subject, and that was domestic intelligence, domestic, domestic security. Here you are dealing in the area of foreign intelligence and national security, and it's quite another subject. Have you reviewed those, uh, that document, no. Mr. Ehrlichman? No. Uh, what, uh, well, Mr. Ehrlichman, the document deals both with national security and with internal security. And when that document was uh, presented by this committee uh, here in testimony, uh, the chairman, with the, the support of the committee, uh, excised out those areas of national security. Uh, but it dealt with a total plan of dealing with intelligence gathering, both involving foreign countries and national security, mm -hmm. as well as internal security. And let, let me read to you. Uh, what, what is the document, Mr. Day? The document is the so-called Houston plan. And we have it here uh, with Mr. Murphy, who's been in custody of the plan, which we can show you. Uh, the, port, the part that has been put into the record has excised out the national security parts. seen the document, so if the witness is familiar with it, why don't we supply him with either the original copy, which Mr. Murphy has here, or another copy? So well, I can supply him with the copy that appeared in the New York Times, which has been compared, compared by Mr. Murphy with the original, and it is accurate with the original, but we can also show him, show him the one, or let's show him the one that Mr. Murphy had. Well, uh, to shorten this up, uh, counsel, uh, I'm not aware that I ever with saw... Just one minute, I think that... Uh, Mr. Murphy can show you the reason. I think it'd be better than the other. Is the question whether I'm familiar with this document? No, no. I asked you whether or not you're ever aware that the President and Mr. Holden had been informed prior to this break-in that such break-ins for national security were in fact clearly illegal and constituted the crime of burglary. Now, Mr. Murphy can show you at least that section I'm talking about. What are all these pasted pieces on here? The pasted pieces, uh, Mr. Wilson, were pasted on to cover up areas which the committee believed involved national security. Well, I don't want a thing handed up here which is, has expurgated portions from it. That underneath is the actual document. Well, the committee uh, excised those in the interests of uh, national security. But they deal with national security. <laughs> I'm going to read a statement in this report which refers both to national security involving foreign powers and internal security, which was the rationale of the persons who prepared this statement. Are you going to leave out any part of that document, Mr. Dash? No, I'm reading right from the document now. The one, Where, that, the, the one that Mr. Murphy just showed me? Yes. Where, Verbatim where you... and complete? No. 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 We, we are not... That document, these documents related to both the methods to be employed in, uh, in gathering international intelligence and domestic intelligence. And this was the a finding. The thing we left out at the instance of uh, the uh, security agencies of this country, we, uh, and because of our own conviction that we did not want to expose methods of uh, obtaining international intelligence, we excised that. Uh, Mr. Wilson, the content, and I think in the interest of national security, the content of what the document says about national security is not relevant to the, the question I'm putting to Mr. Ehrlichman. Uh, but the fact that it dealt with national security and involving foreign parties, uh, powers, is relevant. And I want to read the statement that was given to all the parties who were planning this and ultimately presented to the President of the United States. And I quote, use of this technique meaning surreptitious entry and breaking in, both for either for national security or internal security purposes, is clearly illegal. It amounts to burglary. Wait a minute. Mr. Chairman, I object to reading portions of this document 
I asked for the time that it takes for me to read verbatim everything that Mr. Murphy holds in his hand before this examination continues. This committee has some regard for preserving the uh, inviolate any information that relates to the methods of German international security, uh, international intelligence. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dash has just given well, his own... Well, Mr. Wilson, your motion is overruled by the committee, and let, let somebody object. And I have a new motion, and that is Mr. Mr. Dash is paraphrasing this document. I'm not. You just did? I'm not paraphrasing. No, wait a minute. He, I'm, I'm, he, I am he, saying, and I think the committee found, by the very fact that it excised out portions, that this provision that I'm now reading dealt with both national security and internal security. But I'm not referring to the specific items of national security for the reason the committee excised it. Well, Mr. Dash, I just looked at what you contend you paraphrased, and I must strongly disagree with your description. Well, I, the chair would have to say the chair is quite familiar with these documents. And the chair is not going to divulge anything about the methods by which uh, our various security agencies collect a foreign intelligence. <clears throat> and they were excised from the thing at the by the unanimous consent of the committee. At the advice, by the way, of the various uh, security agencies which reported to this committee that they dealt with national security. I don't, I don't quarrel with their advice. I quarrel with your paraphrasing, Mr. Mr. Dash. Well, Mr. Chairman, could I, could I say a word at this point? Would it be helpful? I understand the point Mr. Wilson makes to be that he wants to see the document that is the source material from which questions are asked. Would it be helpful to have a clean, expurgated copy of this document deleting those sections designated as national security interest supplied to you so that you can be uh, interrogated on those portions? What concerns me, Mr. Vice Chairman, is that uh, according to Mr. Ehrlichman's last answer, the paraphrase which Mr. Dash gave just now does not fit the text. Well, why don't we go back one step and not paraphrase, and I don't want to get into the argument about where you were or want, weren't, but why didn't somebody pick up that document and read it and then ask the question? Well, I'm, I may be able to shorten this up, Mr. Vice Chairman. Apparently, what Mr. Dash is doing here is charging me with somebody's opinion in this document without having first laid the foundation that I've ever seen the document before or participated in the promulgation of the opinion. And, Mr. and Ehrlichman, just, uh, I asked you a wait, question. Let no, the man Mr. Wilson, finish his answer. Mr. Wilson, wait. please. Mr. Wilson. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. As I understood it, when a gavel was used just then, Mr. Ehrlichman was in the middle of an answer. I, I don't think it's unfair no, it was. to let the witness. Excuse me, Mr. Dash, may I finish? to let the witness answer the question, and then if it's inappropriate and unresponsive, to resolve the matter well, then. Mr. Thompson, I don't get in debate with you, but so far we've not had answers. We've had speeches, and well, I that's your Well, that's your conclusion, Mr. Dash, and we're not here for your conclusion. Well, we're I here to answer. listen to the witness. And I want an answer, and I don't want counsel to wait, interfere with the answer. Wait a minute. I think the chap can straighten up all of this controversy. <laughs> and um, and get, then we can get along a little uh, faster. The, ch the chair has read all of the documents referred to. The documents cover the field to, uh, fields of foreign intelligence and domestic intelligence. And without disclosing anything, they apply the same certain principles to both. We excise the references to foreign intelligence in the interest of national security at the request of uh, various uh, intelligence gathering bodies. And the documents relating to both the th thing uh, recommended that present restrictions should be modified to uh, permit the use of this technique that is surreptitious entry. Use of this technique, the document states, is clearly illegal. It amounts to burglary. It is also highly risky and could result in great embarrassment if exposed. However, it is also the most fruitful tool and can produce the type of intelligence 
which cannot be obtained in any other fashion. Now, that's what the now, record shows. Now, can I ask the, the question, Mr. Ehrlichman, was not that I was charging you with the knowledge of this, nor charging you with the reasoning behind it. I merely asked you the question, were you aware that the President of the United States had been informed through this plan that this technique was illegal, clearly, and amount of the burglary. That was the simple question I asked, and again, you jumped ahead and asked that I charge you with a particular thing. I was now, not. Were you aware? No, sir. <laughs> now, I take it also that when such plans were made, and, I, and these were made through an interagency uh, group involving the CIA, the FBA, and other security groups that are ultimately presented for the action of the President of the United States, that such plans are carefully researched and evaluated. Would that be a fair assumption? Mr. Chairman, that's not, uh, that, that, that's not the way we're going to conserve time. I, I think what we're going through right now is evidence that this committee is, in fact, tired. But um, <laughs> that, that's, that's uh, the question of whether it's evidence or not is something that we'll pass on. And I, frankly, am not interested in what this witness thinks about whether it is or is not evidence. I am interested in what he knows or doesn't know. I respectfully recommend that we move on to hard evidence. Well, the, the, witness, the witness has stated that he knew nothing about uh, these uh, documents. And uh, the documents in evidence, and the committee can draw such conclusions from the documents, I, I don't believe that the witness ought to be compelled to testify about matters that he says he knew nothing about. But you did, but you did testify, Mr. Ehrlichman, that in March of this year, you spoke to the President and discussed this particular entry, and he said that he knew that it was uh, legal and justified for national security. Did, did he mention to you that he had received any kind of a contrary uh, advice at any other time? Well, now that question makes an assumption, not an evidence, Mr. Dash, that the President said he knew it was legal. Uh, I don't believe I've ever testified to that. Maybe some other witness has, but I don't know where you got that idea. I, I couldn't answer the question with that assumption in it. I thought that was your testimony. I asked you the question earlier whether or not in March you talked to the uh, President and the President said that he believed it was legal and justified for national security. And I thought you well, answered in the affirmative. I certainly would not want to give you the impression that the President had given me a legal opinion on this at that time. What the President said was that he felt that it was important, that it was necessary, that in the context of the massive thefts turnover to the Russian embassy and all the, all the context of that operation, that, it, that he certainly could not criticize the uh, uh, men who had undertaken this in good faith, believing that they were responding to the urgency of the circumstances. All right, then just leaving the, the testimony that you do leave with the committee is that your own personal evaluation as to its legality was a recent one after advice of counsel. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to leave that impression either, Mr. Dash, and, and uh, I would simply stand on my actual answers. Well, the record will show show. Now, you testify that you met, in fact, your log shows that you met twice with Mr. Dean on June 19, 1972, which was two days after the break-in at the Watergate. Once at noon, uh, alone, and again at 4 p.m. with Mr. Clawson, Mr. Colson, Mr. Curlie. Now, at the noon meeting with Mr. Dean, uh, can, you, can you give us your recollection as to uh, what that meeting was about, whether you were discussing then the Watergate break-in? Yes, I believe we were, and I believe that it was basically to determine between us the uh, inquiries uh, which I felt he ought to make in order to uh, uh, try and determine what, what had taken place. Did he not at that time report to you that he had spoken to you, Mr. Liddy? No, I don't believe so. He made no report at that time to you as to any of the investigations he had made during the day of the 19th. Well, I, had, I have the impression that Mr. Dean hadn't been at work very long at that time and that uh, he was just getting started. Right. Now, at 4 p.m., what was the purpose of the meeting with Mr. Dean, Mr. Clawson, Mr. Colson, and Mr. Curlie? The, the principal purpose, as I recall, was to be in a position to answer inquiries, which I guess Mr. Clawson was getting or the, the, the press people were getting, 
about Hunt's White House status, about whether he was still an employee of the White House, if not, when he had terminated, and under what circumstances, and so forth. And isn't that why Mr. Curlie was brought up and uh, to check the record? Would Mr. Curlie have the record of that? Mr. Curlie was the staff secretary and would have to be involved in any discussion of that kind. There was another subject or two discussed at the time, but as I recall, that was the precipitating question. Well, aside from Mr. Hunt's on the payroll, wasn't a, a focus at that meeting the question of Hunt himself, Hunt's status at the White House, and also the question that Mr. Hunt had a safe at the White House and that the safe ought to be open? Wasn't that part of the discussion? Yes, it was, as I previously testified. Yes. And actually, that safe was open that evening, sometime that evening on the 19th. I don't know. I, I think it must have been either that evening or the next morning. Now, what was the concern and who brought up the concern of what the contents of Mr. Hunt's safe would, uh, would, would show? I don't recall, Mr. Dash. Somebody at, the, somebody at the meeting. I think the way it came up was not so much a, a personal concern as it was um, an inquiry by the investigation, either the Metropolitan Police or the FBI, as to whether Hunt had any belongings in the White House. Now, on June 20, 1972, uh, you met uh, at 9 o'clock with Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Mitchell, joined by Mr. Dean at 945, joined by Attorney General Kleindienst at 955, and then at 1030, you had a meeting with the President. Was that also a follow-up to find out what was going on in terms of the Watergate? I think this was the process of trying to get everybody together who might know anything to try and get a picture of uh, what the investigation was going to be, whether there might be other people involved, uh, just what the, what, uh, to try and get the, the campaign director and, and the head of the Department of Justice and everybody together in one place to ask questions. Now, by that time, Mr. Dean has testified that he interviewed Magruder, Liddy, and that He's also testified that he told you about uh, Liddy's activity, about the fact that uh, Liddy had stated that the Magruder had pushed him into the break-in, and he's also testified that he briefed you uh, on the earlier meetings uh, in, in Mr. Mitchell's office on January 27 and February 4, 1972. Now, did Mr. Dean give you all of that information at that time? No, he did not give me all of that information. He gave me some of it. What, what, what part of it do you acknowledge that he gave you? By uh, the time he came in at 9.45 that morning, or at what time? During that, during that meeting. Oh, during that meeting. I, I don't believe that Mr. Dean contributed very much affirmative information at that meeting. I think that meeting was more for the purpose of hearing from Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Kleindienst what the progress of the investigation was and what was known at the time. My impression is that Mr. Dean told me about his conversation, or part of his conversation with Mr. Liddy at some other time. You know when? No, I don't, but my, uh, the best recollection I have is that it was at some time more remote to his conversation with Liddy than, than this, if in fact it occurred when you say it did. Now, you, the meeting at 10.30 that you have with the President, did you report to the President what you had learned from the parties who attended the earlier meetings? Uh, I told Senator Baker, I believe, the other day that Watergate was not discussed at that meeting, and since then I have rechecked what sketchy notes I have, and I find I was in error on that. I'm sure there must have been some discussion of the Watergate with the President on that occasion on the 20th. There were three principal subjects covered at that meeting. One of them was government uh, wiretapping. And it's obvious to me that, that there must have been some Watergate discussion that led into this discussion, in which I took an assignment from him to get some statistics for him about the incidence of federal wiretapping in, in um, uh, domestic foreign situations, that is, situations involving uh, U.S. citizens and foreign governments, which was a, a statistic he did not have and which he wanted. Now, I'm surmising and reconstructing, but because I have no, no direct notes on this, but I'm just 
I'm just certain that we did discuss Watergate at the outset of that meeting. Well, now, the, on the 23rd, there's no indication that you met with the President between the 20th and the 23rd of June. Now, uh, yes, I met with the President uh, in the company of others on the 21st at 1238 well, and uh, at uh, 520 on the 22nd. Did you meet alone on the 22nd, no. President? No. Oh, I know. And I mean by yourself. Where did you I see. And the reason I ask that is that on well, the 23rd, on the 23rd, you did have your meeting with Mr. Haldeman uh, and Mr. Helms and Mr. Waters. And since the President, on his, in his May 22nd speech, specifically says he told both you and Mr. Haldeman uh, that he was concerned about the CIA problems and asked you to see to it that the investigation didn't uncover these things. Uh, did, on the 20th, when you met with the President, the President give you such instructions uh, or raise these questions with you? No, those instructions came through Mr. Haldeman and were given to me, I think, the morning of the day of the meeting, which would have been the 23rd. So actually, the President's statement on May 22nd that he instructed Mr. Ehrlichman and Mr. Haldeman really should have been he instructed Mr. Haldeman. Well, no, because he uh, he instructed me to attend the meeting, but he instructed me through Mr. Haldeman, and, and a great many of, of my uh, requests from the President would come either from the Staff Secretary or from Mr. Haldeman or possibly someone else. It was not always face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. Now, all right, Mr. Hunt's safe was open in the, in the evening of June 19th, according to the testimony we received, and uh, Mr. Dean met with you on June 21st. And Mr. Dean has testified that prior to that meeting, he had examined the contents of the safe, which were put, placed in his office. Uh, and at this time, uh, did he inform you of the contents of the safe on the 21st? Well, your question, of course, assumes that Mr. Dean knew the contents of the safe. I've heard him testify both ways. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought his testimony was that he did not know the contents of the safe, but that Mr. Fielding had inspected the contents of the safe. Um, I recall only one conversation with Mr. Dean about the contents of the safe in any sort of descriptive terms, and I'm sorry I can't tell you whether it was on that occasion or the, the following week, but what he described for me was simply that there had been papers, uh, a gun, uh, some electronic equipment of some kind, which I've heard described variously as a tape recorder and other kinds of electronic equipment, and that uh, he, he reported to me that Fielding felt that some of the papers were very politically sensitive. Now, that was, the, that was the full report, and when he gave that to me, whether it was the end of the week of the 19th or uh, sometime the beginning of the week of the 26th, I'm not, I'm not able to tell you. Did he not, uh, when he reported to you about the contents of the safe, indicate it also included a forged cable involving the uh, President Kennedy and the so-called Diem uh, assassination? No, he did murder? not. Now, Mr. Dean has testified, and whether it was on this day when he reported to you on the contents or at a later day, that when he told you about the contents with regard to the briefcase, which apparently had some electronic equipment in it, that you said or told him to deep six the contents. Now, did you tell him to deep six the contents when he gave you a description of the contents of the safe? Well, I testified in response to Senator's, Senator Gurney's question on that. In point of fact, uh, Mr. Dash, what Mr. Dean testified to here, you're confusing one of his, one of his uh, press leaks with his testimony, I think. He testified here that I told him to get rid of the briefcase, not the contents. Uh, you probably read in one of the news magazines no. the other version, but the the fact is that um, uh, I never gave him any suggestion or, or uh, direction to do either one. I think Mr. Dean did testify that he to deep six the briefcase and certainly not take the contents out before he deep sixed it. But uh, you say you never you never gave him that instruction. No, sir. Uh, 
And did you ever do you use that term, deep six? Do I use it? Yes. Well, I've used it quite a bit since it was suggested to well, prior me. Prior to that time. Uh, prior that to that, I don't think that's a, that's a uh, familiar part of my lexicon. Well, apparently Mr. Dean didn't seem to understand either what you meant. And when asked, the, his, his testimony, that you mentioned the fact that he goes over the bridge and he could drop it into the water. Do you recall that testimony? No, I, I recall some testimony. Uh, oh, do I recall the testimony? Yes. Yes, I, I recall hearing him say that yeah. here. Now, do you recall having told him that? No, I didn't tell him that. I do recall a conversation with Mr. Dean about the river, because just at this time, uh, Mr. Dean's house was in the process of being flooded by the Potomac. And we had quite a bit of discussion about the fact that he was away from work several days, uh, sandbagging his house and moving the furniture and so on. And uh, we were discussing that in the context of his having held this material from the FBI uh, for what he was concerned might be considered to be an inordinate period of time. And so he may have got mixed up your question about his house and the river no. with the contents? Is no. that your suggestion? No. I don't, I don't think Mr. Dean's at all mixed up. I think he knows exactly what he's trying to do. What well, he's trying to testify to. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Uh, Fielding uh, testified in the depositions in the Democratic National Committee suit on May 15, 1973. It was Mr. Dean's testimony before this committee that after he alleged... Mr. His alleged Fielding testified that it was Mr. Dean's testimony? No, no. I haven't finished my, my question, please. Well, I'm already mixed up. Right. Could we start over? Yes. Mr. Dean testified after you had instructed him to deep six or drop the, uh, the briefcase in the water that he went to see Mr. Fielding and reported back to Mr. Fielding that that was the instruction and they were concerned about it, primarily because too many people uh, had actually seen what had come out of the safe. Now, Mr. Fielding has given his deposition in the Democratic National Committee uh, suit on May 15, 1973. And let me read you what Mr. Fielding states in that deposition. In question concerning the conversation he had with Mr. Dean, his answer was, I would say it was closer to the 20th than the 27th. I'm afraid I can't really pinpoint it much more than that. In the course of the conversations that we had, John indicated that there was a lot of concern about this material, and we had a discussion about it. I would have said, this is not a quote, that it would be unfortunate if some of this stuff leaked out or is revealed to the press. By the same token, it all has to be turned over. It is all evidence, even though obviously some of it is totally unrelated to the break-in. In the context of that kind of conversation, Mr. Dean indicated to me that Mr. Ehrlichman had suggested to him this was in the context of a conversation about the briefcase that he deep six the briefcase. Now, this is Mr. Fielding's deposition recalling what Mr. Dean told him. Now, I just raise that to you on the basis that Mr. Dean testified that he had gone back to t tell Mr. Fielding that you had told him that, and Mr. Fielding has so deposed that he had. Well, Mr. Dash, that's, it's perfectly silly to suggest that I would go to the elaborate lengths that I did in making sure that the Secret Service and Curly and the GSA and somebody from Dean's office was present at the opening of the safe and that I would give instructions for taking custody of the contents and then make a suggestion like that. I, mean, it, um, I think you have to give me credit for um, understanding the importance of evidence in a case of this kind and I did understand that and on the 19th made darn sure that that evidence was preserved in a way that if there were a subsequent trial, the evidence could be identified and, and placed in evidence carefully. It was Mr. Dean's testimony that he had to so instruct you that that was the problem, that so many people had seen it that it would be inadvisable. Well, why don't, you ask, why don't you ask Mr. Colson, Mr. Curly, and Mr. Clausen, who were also at that meeting, who it was that established the process by which the integrity of that evidence would be preserved. And then perhaps you'll get some independent well, view Well, isn't, isn't it true that you did seek to ask Mr. Clawson uh, and Mr. Colson, certainly, on a telephone call concerning whether or not uh, you had made such a statement to Mr. Dean? And you have copies of the... I'm now referring to a transcript 
of a telephone call that you had with Mr. Clawson, which you, your attorney has provided on the subpoena to us. There's no date on this uh, transcript. It's a date on mine. No, I have no date on mine. What date do you have, Mr. April 17. The April 17th does appear on the Colson uh, transcript. On, on the Colson. Yeah. You he switched on you. He switched on you. Well, I got now. For some reason, they excised the date from your copy. Yes. Now, I can, I can read the, the it's, it's short, and I can read it, but I will refer primarily. Uh, you were asking uh, Mr. Uh, Lawson to recall being at, at a meeting uh, or, and, and where this, the question of Hunt's safe uh, had uh, been discussed, and which Mr. Curly and Mr. Colson and Mr. Dean were present. Now, that, that meeting took place uh, clearly on the 19th of June. And towards the bottom there, you say, well, it's interesting, because he says he had a vague memory, and he doesn't recall the details. And you say the bottom, well, it's interesting because Dean, who, as you know, has talked to the United States attorneys at great length, cites some comments of mine in that meeting as evidence of corrupt attitude on my part, and I'm looking for anybody who can help me to recall what took place there. And Mr. Clausen says, that's a hell of a note, John. And you say, I agree. Mr. Clausen says, well, if you want me to be uh, forthwith and straightforward with you, I'll recollect anything you want me to. Yeah, that's and, what I testified to the other day. Uh, Mr. Ellerman says, well, no, let me, let, uh, let me tell you what my problem is, and then you can. I've got to tell what I recall. What I don't recall, he alleges that I said two things at that meeting. One, that we ought to deep six the contents of the safe, quote, unquote, and two, that we ought to get Hunt to leave the country. Now, go on. All right, I'll, I'll read. Oh, oh, I could, listen, John, if anything like that, if either one of those two things were said, that would be vivid in my mind. And Mr. Right, Elliman, I, I think it's think the word so. is recollection. Vivid in my what? Vivid in my mind is what I have here. That's funny. Mine says recollection. Oh, I wonder why we have a different trade. This we got from the, all we got from your attorney. We, had, we did not retype this. Uh, let, me, let me read on and see if we have any, any other differences. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, I would think so. I would think so. Mr. Clausen, and that's objectively. Mr. Ehrlichman, now in point of fact, Dean phoned Liddy and asked Liddy to have Hunt leave the country. Clausen, that's new news to me. Ehrlichman, yeah, but you see, this and what he's doing is saying, well, I was just being a good German and carrying out orders. Mr. Clausen, no, I, I would have absolutely no trouble in remembering either one of those two things if they had been said. Mr. Ehrlichman, well, okay. Mr. Clausen, I would just remember that. Mr. Ehrlichman, yeah, that's a fairly dramatic event. Okay, thank you very much. Awfully sorry to have bothered you. I just don't understand. Mr. Clausen, if there's anything I can do in this thing, please let me... And Mr. Ehrlichman, I will, I will, thank you, can. All right. Now, why, if the meeting, the only meeting that Mr. Clawson attended with you during that period of time was on June 19th, during the day, prior to the time the safe was open, why would you be asking Mr. Clawson if he could recollect whether, whether you had said anything about Mr. Dean about deep sixing, anything about the safe? Because obviously, on the meeting of the 19th, when the safe had not yet been opened, such a conversation could not have occurred yet. Well, this was the this was the version which was reported to the president as having taken place at this meeting on the 15th or 16th by Mr. Peterson, who in turn was reporting what Dean was alleging to the U.S. attorneys. So the president confronted me with this, and I said, "When is this supposed to have happened?" And he said, "Well, what they tell me is that it happened at this at this meeting where you all discussed Hunt and this safe and all this business." So that's why I focused on that meeting as the, as the uh, time that Dean alleged this was supposed to have happened. But it's that's the best information I had at the but, time. But it's quite obvious that since the safe had not been opened yet, uh, not t taking what you say uh, to be true, Dean certainly wouldn't be claiming uh, that you were telling him to deep six something oh, on Mr. that day. Mr. Dash, Mr. Dean has had so many versions of these stories that uh, I don't think you can assume uh, that any one of well, these would be more reasonable than any other. I appreciate your your situation vis-a-vis well, uh, -vis Mr. Dean and, and the committee, but uh, I think you have to recognize 
that there are many, many versions of this story that have been floated to you and the prosecutor and all in the interest of immunity. Mr. Dean has testified that whatever discussion took place about Deep Six took place after the safe was open, and therefore... Well, not, a, not a, uh, I, I submit... He has testified that, here on the road. Oh, well, all right. here. Now, and therefore, what I su suggest to you is that Mr. Clawson wouldn't be a person who might have recalled it, even though you may have thought that was the date that was relevant at the time. If you accept that version at this time. Now, the thing that I s said to you, Mr. Dash, was you get Mr. Clawson and ask him who it was that hedged the contents of this safe about with several witnesses and with a procedure to guarantee the integrity of the evidence in that safe. And I think he'll tell you that I was the one who insisted upon that procedure at the meeting on the 19th. All right. Now, you again called Mr. Colson on April 17th, in which you made a similar inquiry. Yes, sir. Concerning that. Now, uh, your, your conversation with Mr. Colson is you say that two quick questions after the preliminary introduction, where you say hello. Uh, the transcript of April 17th, conversation between Mr. Colson and Mr. Ehrlichman. Does the witness have a copy of that? Yes. I have a copy. I, I find that, that the transcript of the other, other conversation I had did not jive with Mr. Dash. Was, were there any other, uh, when I re was reading, were there any other? Uh, I, I don't know, Mr. Dash. I was more interested in your assertions than yes. well, I was just reading anything else. Nice. I wasn't asserting. I was reading. Assertions, not insertions. No, I said I was reading, not asserting. Uh, now, uh, you say two quick questions. I think it's the first time you get into subject matter. Uh, one thing I should tell you, and it was a great, a great fine last night, really started accelerating. Our great fine last night really started accelerating. Something coming out this morning, Dean and Bob. Now I noticed something coming, that, now I noticed the LA Times has it this morning, but the people that Shapiro has been getting information from, you know, the town is buzzing with, is alive with the story, so I don't think we have a hell of a lot of time. Oh, wait. Can you tell us what that great f fine was last night that was coming out in the L.A. Times? Or? No, sir. All right. I sure can. I, uh, uh, all right. Mr. Colson says, I just thought I'd let you know that. Mr. Ehrlichman, I appreciate it. Mr. Colson, uh, did he, when he went over there, was he given any immunity? Mr. Ehrlichman, not yet. What they've done, apparently, Mr. Colson, they shouldn't give it to him. Mr. Ehrlichman, I know it. What they said to him is that unless he turns up cooperated evidence against Holderman and me, Mr. Colson, is that who he's trying to make? Mr. Ehrlichman, sure. Mr. Colson, who Dean is? Mr. Ehrlichman, yep. Mr. Colson, that's John Mitchell again. And I guess I'll read this, son of a bitch. Mr. Ehrlichman, unless he does that, he doesn't get immunity. Now, my grapevine tells me that you are going to be summoned over there today. Who is your grapevine, by the way, Mr. Ehrlichman? Uh, at that point in time, I don't know. I, I don't know who that would have been. Would have been Mr. Peterson? No, Mr. Peterson wasn't uh, wasn't my source for anything at that at that time. All right, Mr. Colson says, "Oh, really?" And you say, "Yep." And that they're going to ask you about a meeting in my office, which Dean has highlighted as a central gemstone interesting term used then, was it any purpose, purpose for using it, in the case against me. And so just in case you get hauled over, over there before 11 o'clock, maybe I'd better tell you about it. There was a meeting that Curly, Clawson, you, Dean, I had here. Mr. Colson, I wasn't there. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, in my office. Mr. Colson, I was not there. Uh, Dean tried this one out on me Friday night. And I said, the only thing I can ever recall, John, is I once told you I thought it was a stupid uh, goddamn thing for Hunt to be uh, unavailable. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, well, that's the meeting where supposedly I ordered him to tell Hunt to leave the country. Colson, never heard that. And I will so state on the road. Mr. Ehrlichman, or that I admonished everyone that we ought to figure out some way to deep six the contents of Hunt's safe. Colson, no, no way. I was the one who said to get Hunt safe and to be sure it's preserved for the FBI. Mr. Ehrlichman, right. Mr. Colson, A, and I take it A is earlier answer, and B, it's stupid to get another 
uh, country. But that was in my office, not yours, and you weren't present. Mr. Tolson, I can handle that one easily. Mr. Ehrlichman, but you were not in a meeting here. Mr. Tolson, well, I may have been, but I sure don't remember that. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, that's the way, okay. Mr. Tolson, all right, I can handle that. Mr. Ehrlichman, thank you, I'll see you at 11. Mr. Tolson, there's a couple of things you and I need to do to protect each other's flank here, but we'll talk about that, but, but no, I'm serious. Mr. Ehrlichman, fair enough. Mr. Tolson, let's get it clearly understood that that son of a bitch doesn't get immunity. I want to nail him. Mr. Ehrlichman, well, I'm doing my best. Mr. Tolson, no, I want to nail him. I'll take immunity first. <laughs> Mr. Ehrlichman. Mr. Maddox, Mr. Dash, if you'll suspend for just a moment. The chairman admon admonished me before he left to take care of other business. Tell the audience and all those present that he is entirely serious about maintaining decorum in this hearing room. It is inappropriate for the audience to respond in any way to the statements made by the witness, by counsel, or to anything else. On the express and explicit instructions of the chairman, I caution the audience that the committee will not permit demonstrations. Well, I think that's just about, uh, I think you say okay, he says all right, and, and uh, there's a thanks at the end. Now, Mr. Tolson, in that uh, discussion, indicated to you that he didn't recall being, at least at the meeting, with Mr. Clawson, Mr. Curley, you and Mr. Dean. Uh, but it is true he recalls that a discussion concerning uh, getting Hunt out of the country was in his office and you weren't there. But again, uh, Mr. Tolson not being, claiming not being present at the meeting, uh, or on the 19th, uh, could Mr. Colson in any way verify for you uh, that you had not said to Mr. Dean to deep six the content? Well, uh, I'm satisfied that Mr. Colson was present. I have an office log system that logs people in and out of my door on, a, on an actuality basis, so to speak. I, they, only the people who actually go in and out are, are logged, and they're logged at the time that they do go in and out. So uh, it would be, uh, there, you know, there's always room for some error, but I think it a, a practical certainty that he was there in fact. And I was much more interested in whether or not he had any recollection of such a conversation. I think there are two important things in that conversation, Mr. Dash, that uh, you kind of skipped over. One was the fact that Mr. Dean tried this story out on Mr. Colson, which goes to my uh, answer to Senator Gurney the other day that uh, at a point in time, right around this uh, second and third week in April, Mr. Dean was very busily engaged in planting stories here and there as he attempted to plant this story with me that, that I supposedly ordered him to have Hunt leave the country. Second thing is, on the matter of immunity, uh, I had been consistently taking the position since the 22nd of March that no one in the White House should seek immunity in, in any forum whatsoever, that it was extremely inimical to the interests of the President and the White House for someone in the, uh, in the, in the White House staff to in any way uh, seek to be excused for his actions under any circumstances. And my efforts, uh, and I should, have, I should have said this in response to Senator Gurney's question of a few minutes ago with respect to what we were talking about during the days April 15 to uh, 30, one of the things that we were talking about was the public policy that might be involved in anyone in the White House uh, seeking to be immunized from the consequences of his act uh, as an inducement to testify. And I felt strongly then, and I, and I was continuing to feel strongly at this time, that that was a, a wholly improper procedure. I just had this following up on that, just the one or, or two quick questions. Uh, on the immunity. Is it true, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, that you called Mr. Kleindienst uh, sometime before April 14th and, and expressed the same view that nobody should be offered immunity? Prior to April 14th? Prior to April 14th, yes. Well, I recall about a week calling, I recall uh, calling Mr. Kleindienst on about the 28th of March and inquiring of him about the procedures involved in securing immunity. And then at some point in time, I conveyed to him the, the President's decision that 
no one in the White House should be extended immunity. Well, the which question is whether you personally I conveyed uh, heard, that. Heard, not, not the President's position, but you personally suggested to Mr. Feinstein that uh, as, a, no, as a personal point of view? Yes. Well, it's not out of the question, uh, uh, because I was strongly stating that point of view consistently right. through this period of time. And did you participate in the preparation of the President's uh, statement of April 17th, in which, yes, he stated, in which he stated that there was nobody at the White House uh, will be offered uh, immunity in the criminal investigation? Yes, I did. Uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I see the time, uh, uh, I have a, a number of other questions, and perhaps Mr. Dutton's recess. I'll suggest to run 10 minutes more in the recess at 12.30. Now, Mr. Mitchell has testified that on June 21st, he was debriefed by Mr. Marty and LaRue on their talk with Mr. Liddy. And this is the first time that uh, he heard about Liddy's operations, uh, which uh, we referred to and mentioned earlier to you, that he called the White House horrors, and they, they included the Ellsberg break-in, the DM uh, uh, cable, the um, uh, spiriting out Dita Beard uh, from the town, uh, certain wiretapping uh, activities. He listed a number, which he called White House horrors, and identified them as so-called Liddy operations. And this is the first time that he learned about them, he said, on the 21st. I know you, you've testified that maybe Mr. Mitchell's memory isn't correct. But are we really agreeing on the same thing? Uh, I think your testimony, when you refer to your uh, diary uh, and made certain, had certain meetings with various uh, 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 persons concerning the operation of the Special Investigative Unit, at that time, did you, when you made those, had those meetings, discuss with them, and especially Mr. Mitchell, uh, the break into the Ellsberg psychiatrist office? That's a very complicated. Right, let me just let me put it much right. much more clearly. You have testified that Mr. Mitchell's statement on the 20, to us that the first time he heard of the White House horrors and the plumbers' activities involving Mr. Liddy uh, on the 20 that he said the first time he heard about it was on the 21st was an error because you had reported sometime earlier uh, to Mr. Mitchell uh, on this special investigative unit. Is that not correct? Well, you see, we get into, into problems, not just, for instance, in that question. The first time I discussed the so-called plumber's activities and Mr. Liddy with Mr. Mitchell would be quite different well, that's than the first time I uh, heard of or discussed um, uh, these other things. Right. And, that was the question and, uh, I was trying to clarify. Well, I, I'm not sure that... Because uh, the question... You see, what I, what I testified to in answer to a question was that the existence of the special unit and its function, its purpose, as the President conceived it, and the charter which he gave to Mr. Krogh on the 24th of July was discussed with several agency heads and cabinet officers almost immediately thereafter. Now, I don't think I was asked the question uh, whether or not I ever discussed the Ellsberg break-in as such with Mr. Mitchell. I don't recall ever doing so. Well, the question that, that came up was Mr. Mitchell's testimony, not that he learned of the plumbers on the 21st when Mr. Marty and uh, debriefed Mr. Liddy, but learned of Liddy's operations involving the break-in, uh, the DM uh, cable, and the other things. And he said he first learned of that, what he called White House horrors on June 21st. Now, on the next day, on June 22nd, you met with Mr. McGregor, uh, Mr. Colson and Mr. Mitchell at 9, and then you had a second meeting with Mr. Mitchell alone at 11.45. I know you've been asked about that meeting at 11.45 because apparently there was a phone call in between. And the question I put to you is because, is whether or not Mr. Mitchell at that meeting uh, told you about what he learned from Mr. Mardian because he has so testified that he did report to you what he heard and he reported about the so-called White House horrors and talk to you about the need to keep the lid on to protect the election. I, uh, as I've told Senator Gurney, I can't recall specifically the reason that Mr. Mitchell called or I called him and we got together at 1145 on the 22nd. I can say this, though, with, with great assurance. Uh, I never knew until the other day when it was testified to here that Gordon Liddy had had some part in the 
de De Beard business. I had just never heard that from anyone. Nor had I heard about this, this cable until it was either discussed in the press as a leak from your staff or else in the, in the testimony here, one or the other. But at, at, contemporaneous with all of this, I, I was not aware of either of those events at all. Mr. So, Mitchell, never, never informed you of that. No, sir. Uh, by the way, if, in fact, uh, Dita Beard uh, had uh, been spirited out uh, through the uh, help of Mr. Liddy or Mr. Hunt, and if, in fact, Mr. Liddy had something to do with the M cable uh, forgery, uh, and if they were not plumber's work, who else had access to Mr. Hunt and Liddy's time and services while they worked for Mr. Krogh under you? Well, of course, they, they ceased to work for Mr. Krogh under me on the special unit around the 20th of September. And I don't know the dates of those events, but my hunch is that they were later than that. Uh, and uh, I would just be speculating then. I, I don't have any idea. Mr. Hunt still was working at the White House at that time, during these periods of time. Well, no, I can't tell you that of my own knowledge. Well, do you recall when, when you were attempting on the 19th to fix a time when Hunt had left, that what time you did fix? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the 19th, I don't think we did fix. I think there was still a lot of confusion, and I think Mr. Curlie was going to go back and, and check some records. Uh, now, despite your claim, Mr. Ehrlichman, that you had so many things to do that uh, the Watergate was really not central in your focus, you do seem to have been busy on Watergate matters since on the very next day, June 23rd, you and Mr. Haldeman met with Mr. Helms and General Walters, and we've had, and, and I'm going over that testimony because I think that's been fairly clearly covered, but you did meet with Mr. Haldeman and with Mr. Helms and Mr. Walters, and the topic of the conversation there was the question of whether CIA involvement was involved. Was that not so? Well, Mr. Dash, I'd like to go back to the preamble to your question, because any answer that I might give might seem to adopt its assumptions. Um, there isn't any dispute in the evidence that in the 12 days before I left Washington and went to California that I had a number of meetings uh, with regard to Watergate, both with Mr. Dean and on this occasion with uh, Helms and Walters. I have never uh, uh, put a contention to the contrary. But if you look at my log and you look at the other records, you will see that once the 26th of June came, and I left town, or whatever that date was, let's see, 29th of June came, and I left town, that my frequency of contact with this subject dropped off practically to zero. So I wouldn't want the, the little uh, lead-in to your question to give anybody the false impression that you apparently have entertained. Well, the, the, the impression, at least I want to leave, that you're leaving also is that right after the break-in, you were heavily involved. Oh, I've testified to that two or three times. And, uh, and the reason that I was, I think you know. Now, uh, once, we, once we get to this Helms-Walters meeting, uh, again, I think you know, the, that meeting was convened by the President because of a very strong concern he had about the jeopardy of the CIA's integrity, secrecy of its operations. Uh, and he wanted to be absolutely sure that this all-out FBI investigation could go forward without jeopardizing that secrecy. But you have characterized, at least so testified concerning that meeting, that that meeting is which you were making an inquiry as to whether or not there was CIA involvement and that uh, actually Mr. Helms and Mr. Walters were going to make a check on that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Walters has testified and, and Mr. Helms that uh, they had already, in fact, Mr. Helms had had a meeting the day before with the acting FBI director, Mr. Gray, in which he told him there was no CIA involvement. Well, I hope, that he I was being I hope you get a chance to ask him about that CIA letter of July 6th and why it was that it was not then for another six days until the CIA gave firm assurance to the FBI that there was no CIA exposure. Well, do you know, that as a matter of fact, the reason for that is that after Mr. Are you going to testify now, no. Mr. Dash? No. Their testimony, testimony will come forward. And that, that as a matter of fact, based, you, based on your, and Mr. Walters has to testify, that based on your direction, or Mr. Holdeman's direction, 
He did, in fact, go and tell Mr. Gray something different than what Mr. Helms had told him oh. the day before. Well, you're confusing, Mr. You're Chairman, confusing just, just one, two just things. Just one minute, Mr. Ehrlichman, if you will. We're going to continue these hearings past August 3rd, it would appear. And that's going to be over my firm objection and, and, and maybe even beyond the scope of my energy and resources. But we're not going to, we're not surely going to serve the purpose of trying to expedite this thing if we not only do not inquire of the witness about what he's testified to or what other test witnesses have, but what future witnesses may testify to. Now, I haven't heard Walters or Helms testify. And if it's necessary to call this witness back and to ask him questions about the Helms and Walters testimony, I think we ought to do it. But just in the pure interest of time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to suggest that our inquiry, all of us, including me, that we limit our inquiry to what this witness has said or what other witnesses on this record have said on the same subject matter. Mr. Chairman, I agree with that, of course. But it was this witness who was constantly referred in his testimony uh, to Mr. Walters' uh, July 6th uh, statement. And it was in response to that that the question was put. Well, I'll just suggest the counsel uh, rephrase his question and ask the witness to testify what he said, what Mr. Walters said. I think that's That'd fine. Be I think that's proper. Very good. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, just the time Senator Baker spoke, I was in the process of pointing out to counsel that you have two different subjects here. One is direct CIA involvement in the breaking, and the other is possible unrelated CIA activities which might be disclosed by a vigorous FBI investigation. Now, I think you have to be very careful in defining what it was that Director Helms and Mr. Gray discussed the previous day and what it was we discussed at this meeting and how the thing was narrowed down at this meeting and what it was that General Walters was going to go talk to Mr. Gray some more about. I think in the end... May just be an appropriate time to... Recess for lunch. Mr. Chairman, may I inquire about the scheduling? Uh, Mr. Alderman is also our client, and I'd like you to suggest whether he should be here at 2 o'clock. He has a statement which will take him, hopefully, not over two hours to read, and I would like to ha have him do it on the same day, the whole thing. Well, um, I would suggest that he come in at 3 o'clock. I three hope that we can finish the last article by that time. I don't know whether we can or not, so, but I hope. Today's break for food gave the senators and council a chance to cool their tempers a bit. Public television coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Jim Lehrer. As the hearings resume, Sam Dash has more questions about John Ehrlichman's contacts with CIA officials. Council will resume the interrogation of witness. I forgot to turn on the loudspeaker. Mr. Ehrlichman, following uh, the meeting that you had, or the meeting you had on June 23rd uh, with Mr. Walters, and Mr. Helms and Mr. Haldeman. Did you instruct Mr. Dean to uh, contact Mr. Walters and follow up on the June 23rd meeting? No, sir. Uh, I simply notified Mr. Dean that there had been a meeting, that General Walters was going to be talking with Mr. Gray, and that we had indicated to General Walters that Mr. Dean would be his contact from that point forward. And did there come a time when General Walters did call you and ask you and tell you that he was going to have a meeting or that Dean had contacted him and was it all right for him to speak to Mr. Dean? It either happened that way or 
I told him at the time of the meeting on the 23rd that Dean would be his contact, one or the other, but I, I am quite sure that I indicated to General Walters that Dean was the White House uh, man uh, uh, who was looking after this whole subject. And were you aware that Mr. Dean, in fact, did meet with General Waters on June, June 26? No, I was not aware of those meetings, uh, which a I... series of meetings. Yes, I understand there were, and I, did, I was not aware of that series of meetings until just recently. And Mr. Dean did not report to you on them? No, he didn't. Now, on June 28, 1972, uh, you met with Mr. Dean and Mr. Gray, and we've had some testimony on that, uh, and that on that same day, you had two earlier meetings with Mr. Dean. Do you, you recall what the two earlier meetings were before the meeting with Mr. Dean and Mr. Gray were about? Not specifically. I surmise that one of them was simply an um, informational meeting, uh, knowing that um, I was about to leave town for an extended period of time. Uh, as I recall, there was a conversation, and whether it was by meeting or, or whether it was by telephone, I can't recall, but on the same day that we met with Pat Gray, I'm quite sure we had a conversation about turning over the contents of uh, Hunt Safe to Mr. Gray. All right. Then you had your meeting with Mr. Gray, and uh, I think you've already testified to the circumstances under which a particular uh, packet or, or envelope was turned over to Mr. Gray. Right. And I don't. We don't need. It. I think we've had full testimony on that. Now, by the way, did you know at the time that that packet or materials were turned over to Mr. Gray, what was contained in the packet? No. Uh, had you been told by Mr. Dean that they were sensitive materials, politically sensitive materials? Yes. Now, I think you testified in a response to a question to Mr. Gurney uh, on page 5438 of the uh, testimony. Uh, did you have, Mr. Senator Gurney, uh, asked you, did you ever have any communication with Mr. Gray about these documents after that meeting? I'm referring to the uh, June 28th meeting. And you answered, yes, sir. Uh, and Senator Gurney said, uh, and re recount to the committee. And your answer was, that was in April of this year. Uh, we had a conversation. The president asked me to telephone Mr. Gray. It was a Sunday night, and it was the 15th of April, about 10, 15 p.m. I was in the President's EOB office, and he had a meeting that day with Mr. Kleindy. The subject of these documents came up at that meeting, and then you were asked to call Mr. Gray, and I just want to, you refer to that telephone call. Uh, you said, I told him at that time that the delivery of the documents to him, to Mr. Gray, had been the subject of this conversation between the Attorney General and the President and that Mr. Dean apparently had told the prosecuting attorney about the fact that he had made the delivery. Mr. Gray said, quote, well, he can't do that, unquote. And I said, quote, well, he did say that, unquote. And he said, quote, if he says that, I will deny it, unquote. And I said, quote, well, Pat, it isn't a subject for denial. Obviously, it's not something you can deny. I recall the episode very clearly, unquote. And while he says, quote, you have got to back me up on this, and then he went on to say, I destroyed the documents. And I think at that point you said you were um, uh, nonplussed about it, and uh, you, uh, you hung up, and then you decided after talking to the president that perhaps you had made it clear uh, that you were not going to back him up, and you called him back, and, I, and without rereading the testimony, you made it very clear to him that uh, if you had to call to testify, you would tell the truth about that. Now, isn't it true... Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, that that was not the uh, next time or that you had a conversation with Mr. Gray about those documents, that the, the April 15th meeting. Didn't Mr. Gray get the in touch? The next time? Yeah, the question put by Senator Gurney was that after the June 28th meeting, did you again or have an occasion to talk about those documents to Mr. Gray? And you, your, your oh, answer, I see. Your well, answer was you're, the April 15th phone call. You're, you're referring to the... the um, rather oblique reference in Mr. Gray's uh, phone report to me about his confirmation hearings, perhaps, and that's correct. Yeah, we, March we, discussed, and eight. we discussed it in a, in a much less specific way um, in terms of what he was testifying to in the confirmation hearings about whether he had delivered all of the 
or whether uh, Dean had delivered all of the documents to the FBI in a package or in parcels? Well, well Mr. Irvin, actually, although it wasn't, it was, as you put it, perhaps in a more bleak way, but the, the conversation really was uh, pretty much the same, only this time Mr. Gray, uh, in his uh, telephone call, and I'm referring to the uh, transcript of the telephone call uh, that you had with Pat Gray on March 7th or 8th, 1973. That's the one that I testified at length yes. with Senator White yes. about. And what I'm referring to is that at this time, wasn't the conversation somewhat different? Uh, and, and let me just read. Uh, Mr. Gray, towards the bottom of the first page of that transcript, says, another thing I want to talk to you about is that I'm being pushed awfully hard in certain areas and I'm not given an inch. And you know those areas that I think you've got to tell John Wesley to stand awful tight in the saddle and be very careful about what he says and to be absolutely certain that he knows in his own mind that he delivered everything he had to the FBI and don't make any distinction between but that he delivered everything he had to the FBI. And you say, right. And then he says, and that he delivered it to those agents. This is absolutely imperative. And you say, all right. And he says, you know I've got a couple of areas up there, and I'm hitting hard, and I'm just taking them on the attack. And you say, OK. I wanted you to know that. And you say, good. Keep up the good work, my boy. Let me know if I can help. And he says, all right. He can, he can help by doing that, meaning I'm taking John Dean. And you say, good, I'll do it. And then, and at that time, by the way, in your telephone call with Mr. Gray, when he suggests that to you, and this is before Mr. Dean has gone to the U.S. Attorney's Office and made any statement uh, that uh, such a delivery was made to Mr. Gray, uh, you do not, do you, tell Mr. Gray, as you did when you were calling from the President's Office, uh, well, that didn't just happen that way, Mr. Gray. Um, I was there, and I saw that it was delivered to you. It wasn't all turned over to the FBI. Why, why didn't you tell him then, instead of saying, OK, all right, why don't you then catch him up there and say, well, the truth is, Pat, you did get them. Well, the, the conversation with Gray, as I read it, uh, that you've just quoted, was Gray saying to me, um, I'm saying that the FBI got all these documents, which is, which is true, but I'm not making any nice distinction about the fact that it came in, in two parcels. Now, I suppose that uh, uh, from a hindsight standpoint, there was a hint there that he had some other problem with these documents, but I didn't, I didn't pick up that hint. I, I didn't understand what he was concerned about. And so I took it that what that was all about was simply Mr. Gray saying, to me that that is the manner in which he was testifying and that he certainly want, wouldn't want Dean to uh, volunteer anything that in any way would disrupt that testimony. It would keep integral or, or protected the fact that, uh, in fact, they had come to the FBI in two parcels instead of in one parcel. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Erdman, didn't you really pick it up and identify it? Because you called Mr. Dean shortly afterwards, immediately following, according to the transcript. And the conversation is as follows with Mr. Dean. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Dean. Mr. Dean, hello. Mr. Ehrlichman, hi. Just had a call from your favorite witness. Mr. Dean, which is? Mr. Ehrlichman, Patrick J. Gray. Mr. Dean, oh, really? Mr. Ehrlichman. And he says to make sure that old John W. Dean stays very, very firm and steady on his story, and he delivered every document to the FBI and he doesn't start making nice distinctions between agents and directors. Mr. Dean then says he's a little worried, isn't he? And you say, well, he just doesn't want there to be any question. He says he's hanging very firm and tough, and there's a lot of problem around. Now, uh, well, probing around. Probing around, excuse me. Yeah. Now, well, that's exactly so what, what I So what you do is you actually carried out Mr. Gray's request. Uh, uh, far from telling Mr. D Gray when he called you that, as a matter of fact, there were two deliveries. Uh, he did really receive something personally, uh, as he was trying to tell you late, uh, later in his discussion when you were calling him from the president's office. Uh, you did call Mr. Dean. Uh, you did call Mr. Dean, uh, and you did tell carry you, you did carry that message to Mr. Dean, and you did tell Mr. Dean that Mr. Gray wants Mr. Dean to be sure to stand tight and make no distinction between F FBI agents and directors that all went to the FBI. 
and therefore weren't you in fact participating in the covering up of that situation in which a packet was given to Pat Gray, which later was destroyed. Now, you didn't know it at that time. I didn't know it. Well, you didn't uh, know it at that time. As far as I was concerned, there was, there was a perfectly proper way of going about delivering these documents to the FBI. Having the concern that we did, that either the field office or the lower echelons of the FBI were leaking this stuff all over, that to put it in the hands of the director was a, was a perfectly appropriate device. But, but why now, did you uh, think... There was no, no uh, cover-up in that, and, no, I, but, and I don't apologize for it for a minute. But why... The cover-up that I was invited to participate in in the call from the president's office was of quite another nature. And this was, this was Pat Gray suggesting to me I never got them, and uh, I'll deny I ever got them, and that kind of thing, well, which uh, I, I just couldn't... Well, isn't, isn't he saying the same thing in the earlier call? He's, no, saying, he's no. saying, let's not make a distinction, and let's ma make it clear that it went to the FBI so that no one would ever think I ever got them. No, I don't think you can read that into it. Well, why, did you ask him, did you ask them, or did, there, did it occur to you then, if you didn't see anything there, well, what's the problem, Pat? Oh, I wish I had, believe but me. What's the problem? I, why, would, yeah. why would Mr. Gray believe me, ask I wish you to tell John Wesley to stand tall and make no distinction? What, what would, it came into your mind that it would be concerning him. Well, if, if he had testified, um, it came in two parcels, and I have the one, I have the one parcel, and it has nothing to do with uh, uh, Watergate, but I'm holding this one parcel, that they would zero in on that as they had zeroed in on other aspects of this thing and attempt to open it up and get at the politically embarrassing documents and, and exploit that. Uh, well, to that extent, then, you were assisting him in preventing that from happening. Well, I hope so. Uh, that was the whole idea of, of delivering it in two parcels. As far and as therefore, concerned. you were carrying out that, uh, 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 and again, uh, well, you may disagree with my term, but carrying out at least a cover-up of this delivering to Mr. Gray the separate sensitive political uh, documents so it wouldn't be exploited. Well, there was no, no intent here uh, to, in any way, um, uh, do away with those documents or keep them from persons who had a, had a proper right to them. Uh, the uh, uh, thing that disturbed me in the April conversation, of course, was his invitation to me to side in with him in the story that he never got the documents in the first place against the background of his having destroyed them. And uh, uh, after hanging up the phone, I thought, well, I've got to just make this as clear as possible to him that I'm, I'm not in this. And, uh, uh, but at that point, Mr. Dean had already gone to the, to the prosecutors and, and uh, let it out of the bag. It was clear well, now that uh, Mr. Gray had got the package. It did not, it did not come to, to the president from the uh, uh, U.S. attorney that the documents had been destroyed. Uh, so far as I know, that was discovered in this phone conversation with Mr. Gray for the first time. Now, I heard testimony here to the effect that I knew back in January or sometime that these documents had been destroyed. And that is, that is totally incorrect. In point of fact, uh, had I known anything about the destruction of the documents back at that time, I dare say that my recommendation to the President with regard to Mr. Gray's nomination would have been very strongly negative. Well, my question, to make it very clear, does not go to your knowledge of the destruction of the documents at that time, but it goes to the question of your knowledge that he did receive the packet and that you did, in fact, carry out uh, Mr. Gray's request to tell Mr. Dean to uh, uh, to stand tight in such a way that uh, he shouldn't make the distinction between FBI agents and directors. And, uh, just, just as it right, says Just there, as uh, it says there, and as you've indicated, to keep from any politically embarrassing matters from uh, being exploited. Leaked. Or leaked. Now, on July 26, you did, uh, well, you have a, uh, your diary shows that you met with Mr. Kalmbach. And by that time, by that time, you had already okayed, I take it, uh, Mr. Dean's use of Mr. Kalmbach for raising funds for legal defense of the Watergate defendants. Now, how did that come about? Uh, did Mr. Dean come to you and say that he wanted uh, to be able to contact Mr. Uh, Mr. Kalmbach for this purpose? Well, I wouldn't want to answer this question in any way that might seem to adopt the lengthy preamble that you've just delivered. Uh, I, have, I have testified a couple of times about a conversation that I actually had with Mr. Dean in this connection. And very simply, as I recall, it was a phone call, or it may have been at one of these uh, information meetings. He said, I wish you'd back me up. John Mitchell feels very strongly that uh, uh, he's got to try and recruit Herb to do this uh, defense fundraising, and uh, I'm going to ask him to do that. It was just that, about that, was just about that, that much. 
And on that alone, uh, you allowed Mr. Kalmbach, uh, at least Mr. Dean, uh, to go to Mr. Kalmbach and, uh, and ask him to do it. I didn't allow anybody to do anything. I mean, it, uh, it wasn't up to me to, to grant permission to anybody to do anything under those circumstances. Well, I think you have told us when we had our interview, and I think uh, Mr. Kalmbach has testified that, uh, and I think you used the term during our interview, that you had a sort of a lock on Mr. Kalmbach. And I think your testimony is that in order to protect Mr. Kalmbach from being imposed upon, that you would say that after he had done his original work that uh, they couldn't come to him and ask him to do other f fundraising without getting a any approval through you uh, or Mr. Haldeman. Isn't that right? Well, I couldn't possibly agree to that very long question, Mr. Dash. There are so many things wrong with it. What, what actually happened, as I, again, testified a couple of times to, is that when the April 7th uh, campaign financing law was, a, was coming into effect, Mr. Kambach let us know, or let me know, that uh, he didn't want to do any more fundraising in the campaign. Uh, Maury Stans was pressing him hard to help him. It was a very tough job. Herb wanted to be relieved of that, and he wanted to do some other kinds of chores in the campaign that he would find more interesting. And so we agreed that if either Mr. Mitchell or, or by then I think it was, well, let's see, I guess it was Mr. Mitchell still then, and, and Mr. Stans uh, approached Herb that Herb could use me and, and Bob Haldeman as an excuse uh, that he was working for us, and that we would back him on that. Now what's that? Uh, that's what I, I thought I'd asked you. Maybe my, my question wasn't that clear. Uh, I, I thought I said that you had made an arrangement with Herb to, uh, to protect them. Well, that, you have uh, a way of festooning your questions, Mr. Dash, with uh, uh, facts that apparently are only in your knowledge. Well, well, I, I may, uh, I, well we won't, we won't uh, go back and forth on this. I think we'll go to and follow up on the questioning. Uh, now, did you know at all how much money would have been in, would be involved? No. You didn't inquire. No. Uh, did you think? Did you know how the money was going to be raised? No. And did you inquire? No. Uh, now you knew. You're speaking now as I'm of the time of my conversation with Mr. Dean. With Mr. Dean, yes, yes. with Mr. Dean. Uh, did you? Uh, you knew, of course, that by this time, that Mr. Hunt and Mr. Liddy were defendants or among the defendants who would be assisted by them? I assume so. I'm, I'm not certain of that, but I assume so. I think the newspapers and the public record at well, least would have I, brought I, that to you. I can't relate the yeah. two. Now, uh, again, uh, didn't you have a special purpose uh, to assist uh, in the paying of their legal defense funds? I didn't have any purpose, general or special. Well, here was your same Mr. Hunt and Liddy, who had been involved in uh, the plumber's activity and the Ellsberg break-in, now being involved here. Uh, were you concerned that unless they were, were uh, paid their legal defense uh, fees, that uh, they might well cause some trouble? Now, as I recall, the, the uh, context in which this was discussed was uh, primarily a Cuban uh, uh, emigre uh, uh, stimulated defense fund, which John Dean told me about, that was being created in Florida and would be the vehicle for this. And so, if anything, my focus would have been on those participants in this, in that particular conversation. Well, then why did they need Mr. Kalmbach? To bring money in, to, I assume. And this was, was, again, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, question this at all. It was something that, that was just brushed over in passing. In other words, and you, and you didn't, and you didn't think at this time that this money would go to pay Mr. Hunt's lawyers or Mr. Defense, uh, Mr. Liddy's lawyer? It, it just was not a question that I addressed myself to one way or the other, either, either affirmatively or negatively. And this is the kind of thing that you did treat that lightly? Yes, sir. Now, having, having as you indicated just now, uh, just uh, treated it as lightly as you did when Mr. Dean came. Uh, you did meet Mr. Kalmbach on the 26th. I know there's a dispute in your testimony concerning what the purpose of that meeting was. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kalmbach has testified here, and he testified that because of the clandestine manner in which he was being asked 
to have this money dispersed he really became concerned and that he really wanted to check on mr dean's authority and he trusted you so much that he came to you and i think we've had with a very this his testimony of his dramatic confrontation with you which involved look into my eyes and i'll look into yours do i really have to do it and i uh, and i had a later later telephone call which spoke to that uh, spoke about that meeting now is it still your testimony that mr comeback did not did not come to you and express deep concern about his carrying out this act of this uh, defense raising money and wanted to come back and ask you whether or not it was proper and should he really do it and do it secretly would you restate the question well on, this, on the 20 on the 26th of july did mr comeback come to you and as he's testified before this committee express his deep concern about the propriety of his continuing and raising this money and ask you to tell him it's all right that he should keep doing it Mr. Dash, i have no recollection of any conversation with mr kambach be it on this date or on the 14th when we met and i believe discussed this same subject in which he asked me to vouch for the propriety of what he was doing as i explained before to senator gurney i would be very very slow to assure herb kambach of the propriety of any undertaking unless i myself were satisfied of it because herb is the last fellow in the world that i would want to involve in something that was improper so i just don't recall that happening and i doubt very seriously that it ever did happen in those kinds of terms now you your previous question or attempt had something in it about john dean's authority and that's the reason that i wanted you to repeat the question uh, i'm not aware of any uh, uh, possible uh, question of john dean's authority to ask mr kambach to do something as as being an issue between us at any time uh, it doesn't make sense uh, uh, it doesn't it, it is it's not related to um, our uh, our true relationship in any way in other words to, for someone to come to me and say does Don, john dean have authority to ask me to do this is out of whack with what was our real relationship which was that herb kambach could do anything he wanted to do but that if he wanted an excuse we'd be his excuse not to do it and uh, uh it, it as it developed he agreed to do this and he was well down the road you see uh, starting back in uh june and here we're talking about the, the third week in july uh and he's been doing this all this time that is more characteristic it seems to me of our true relationship which was that he was a free agent to do anything he wanted to do but if he was looking for an excuse we'd be his excuse not to do it vis-a-vis -vis mr mitchell or mr stan so well, this business of john dean authority uh is what really got me um uh, kind of um uh, doubtful about your other form of question well the question was based on mr comeback's testimony on oath here in which he was he testified that he had come to you to check on that authority that when mr dean he said asked him to do something or you that he felt such people so high up in the white house that it was like coming from the president and that he would follow these instructions because um, he wanted to be of service but well you, let me let me comment in on, on that if i may mr dash our relationship with herb kambach was never one of principal and agent where we simply issued instructions to him uh, when uh, we wanted him to help out it was always very much on a on a peer relationship where if there were a project that we were interested in having him help on of one kind or another be it legal work or anything else we requested him and if he didn't feel comfortable with it or he had an adverse relationship in the office uh, in his private practice or if he just didn't like the sound of it he felt very free to say no thank you and uh, this business of, of his uh, marching to orders from the White House doesn't, it just doesn't ring true to me. Well, all right. May I re refer you to your telephone conversation with Mr. Kambach on April 19, 1973, and ask you to look to page four, at page four.
And uh, I'll, I'll read whatever you want me to read, but let me start with Mr. Kalmbach's statement, or I can begin with yours. Mr. Ehrlichman, somewhat down the line. But I think the point that which I will make in the future, if I'm given the chance, that you were not under our control in any sort of slavery sense, but that we had agreed that you would not be at the beck and call of the committee. Mr. Kalmbach. And of course, too, that I act only on orders, and you know on direction. And if this is something that you felt sufficiently important and that you were assured it was altogether proper, then I would take it on because I always do it and always have. And you and Bob and the President know that. And then you reply, yeah, well, as far as propriety is concerned, I think we both were relying entirely on Dean. Mr. Kalmbach, yeah. Mr. Ehrlichman, I made no independent judgment. Mr. Kalmbach, yep, yep. Mr. Ehrlichman, and I'm sure Bob didn't either. Mr. Kalmbach, no. And I'm just, I have just the feeling, John, that I don't know if that's a weak read, is it? And you ask who, Dean? You say, no, I mean, are they still going to say, well, Herb, you should have known. Now, you testified, one, that it was not on orders, that he didn't act that way, and two, that the question of propriety never came up. But here is Mr. Kalmbach talking to you, and you're certainly not disagreeing with him, that he's stating that I act only on orders, and you know on direction, and if this is something that you felt sufficiently important and that you were assured it was altogether proper, then I would take it on, because I always do it. Now, at that point, you say that the propriety issue, you based it on Dean's judgment, made no independent judgment. And neither did Bob Holden make any independent judgment. Now, I take it that that's where the testimony rests. What is your question, Mr. Well, the question is that when Mr. Kalmbach calls you on this particular day, on the 19th of April, he is reminding you that he acts on, he was acting on orders. Well, what did I remind him, Mr. Dash? That you're reminding him then. You're reminding him then is that you relied on the propriety no. issue on Dean. I, what I'm reminding him is that you were not under our control in any sort of a slavery sense. Well, and that is precisely sense. what I've just well, been testifying slavery. here. Principal, well, agent, or, or well, master, wasn't your slave. servant, or whatever you want to well, call not it. not a slave, but well, he says, I take orders. And if you direct been, me, uh, I do it. You've been highly selective, Mr. Dash, oh, and well, you're, I'll, uh, uh, I'll stand very flatly on all four corners of that conversation. Well, I, I think you have, and it's obviously what you're telling now, Mr. Kalmbach, is that you made no independent on uh, independent judgment on the propriety. When well, that's Mr. what I testified to you. I know, and when Mr. Kalmbach has come and testified to us, that he counted so much on your reassuring him that it was proper, and you told him, according to Mr. Kalmbach's testimony, that yes, it was important that he do it, and that it was it was had to be secretive, and that if they, they didn't do it that way, they might have their heads in the lap. But I well, think as the, you as the you see, my my recollection before he testified is the same as it is now. Now, in August 1972, uh, you uh, you then uh, well, we've had testimony on this, but I'm just raising this on the question on all this. Well, I know, but uh, right now it's a a question of bringing some of this down to a little more finiteness than we've had it. Uh, when you, you called Mr. Peterson and asked that Mr. Stans not go to the grand jury, you did that in August 72. Uh, and I think we've had plenty of testimony on that. Do we know that? I, I wasn't able to fix that date. What date do you have for that? Uh, sometime in August of 1972. I'm not able to say. I don't have a specific date. Uh, now, do you recall meeting Mr. Kalmbach again on August the 8th? It's in your diary that you did. Uh, not, not with regard to any specifics that were discussed in the meeting. I see it on the log, and I have no doubt that it took All place. Right, now, Mr. Kalmbach's recollection was that after he had had that meeting with you, uh, he then went out and made a uh, he obtained some private funds uh, from a private contributor, $75,000, and that when he saw you on the 8th, uh, that he was just, he just reported to you uh, that he was able to raise $75,000 from a private uh, campaign contributor for this defense fund. Do you recall his reporting to you uh, that he was able to raise that money at that time? I had the impression that that was what he was telling me July 14th out in his office. 
because we discussed his use of uh, Tony Elasowicz to carry money, and my impression was that he was carrying that from the West Coast to the East Coast. I never did know the amount that he raised until I talked to Mr. Kambach in April of this year uh, while I was conducting this inquiry. Uh, and I don't recall his ever telling me who it was that he raised the money from, although I heard him testify to the effect did, that... Did he, he tell you how much he raised? I think in April he did, yes. I think he told me $70,000. Well, I, I mean earlier. I'm talking about sometime in August. No, I don't think I knew about it before April of this year. Did you know at all that he raised it from a private campaign contributor? Campaign contributor? Yes, somebody who had been given campaign funds to the president. For the re-election of the president. I think he described to me that it was uh, a business. Uh, uh, my impression was it was two people, and they were in business in California. And that was all the description that I think I had. And did that raise any problem in your mind that maybe Mr. Comback was going to campaign contributors? For no, the I, didn't, defense I, fund? I didn't connect the two, I don't believe. All right. Now, after June 17, the, the date of the break-in, what information did you have, Mr. Ehrlichman, about Mr. Magruder's involvement in the Watergate shortly after? There was a lot of, there was a lot of suspicion shortly after, and I, I would put this in, the, say, the first uh, six weeks uh, after the, after the break-in. A good deal of suspicion of Mr. Magruder, um, largely based on uh, what Mr. Sloan was saying to people. And so there was a good deal of speculation uh, that I can recall during that, during that period of time, and it culminated in the conversation which Mr. Dean and I had with the Attorney General on the 31st of July, where this was specifically discussed, uh, that is Mr. Magruder's involvement. The Attorney General said, based on the uh, FBI interviews and the prosecuting attorney's uh, examination into Mr. Magruder's involvement, that it appeared that any involvement that he had related to money. And there is, was a, a square dispute between Mr. Magruder and Mr. Sloan as to the truth of the assertion about Mr. Magruder's involvement, and that the Attorney General anticipated that Mr. Magruder might possibly uh, be going to take the Fifth Amendment before the grand jury. Now, that remained the open question, so far as I knew, until uh, Dean or someone told me that Magruder had, in fact, testified to the grand jury. And then, as, as matters unfolded, um, uh, he testified at the trial, and he was considered to have told the truth, and he came out of the, sort of out of the well, shadow at that point. All right, but were you aware that during this period of time, in the end of June, July, and August, that Mr. Mitchell, Mr. La uh, LaRue, Mr. Mardian, Mr. Magruder, Mr. Dean were in frequent meetings, daily meetings, discussing uh, uh, the fact of Magruder's involvement no. and the fact that Magruder was going to tell a particular story to the grand jury? No, I was not. Uh, Mr. Dean has testified that he acted as a liaison and he, and he did inform you. Yes, well, that's not correct. Now, as a matter of fact, if he had, uh, it would not be inconsistent with a meeting in the presence of the Attorney General uh, where the, uh, the Attorney General would be reporting that there was nothing with Mr. Dean's being silent. Because if, if, in fact, Dean was involved in a cover-up, I take it he would not have a, uh, let the Attorney General know about it. Would you repeat that question? Well, I was please? saying that you said that the only time you uh, had any clear uh, understanding, or at least the Attorney General's understanding of uh, Mr. Magruder's involvement, is when he met with you and Mr. Dean and told you that there was no involvement. Is that true? When Mr. Magruder met with Mr. Dean and, and me? And the Attorney General. The Attorney General. Mr. Uh, Magruder and the Attorney General met with Mr. Dean and me? Yes. I don't recall any such meeting. Well, you did say that the Attorney General reported to you concerning Mr. Magruder. Did you not? Yes. And what did he tell you then? Just what I just testified, that uh, they considered it uh, uh, an important uh, uh, conflict in the evidence as between Sloan and Magruder, and the way it looked to the Attorney General at that point in time, Mr. Magruder might take the Fifth Amendment. Now, uh, you were aware that on September 15th, uh, the indictment came down uh, on the so-called the seven defendants. Yes. Uh, you had a meeting with Mr. Holliman on September 15th. Did you discuss the indictment at that time? Well, I didn't have any 
extraordinary meeting with Mr. Haldeman on the 15th. Uh, that would have been just the ordinary morning staff meeting, I assume, which would have included all of the department heads of the White House. What time was that meeting? Well, it would be at 8 or 8.15 in the morning. I think the diary that we have from you shows a meeting at 11 o'clock in the morning. Does your diary show that? Let me uh, check. You're correct. I don't know the purpose of that meeting, Mr. Dash. I haven't any idea. The um, indictments, however, uh, the market around the White House has sort of discounted that September 15th action, so to speak, by reason of the Attorney General's announcement on September 12th to the President and the Cabinet and to some of us assembled that the seven uh, suspects were the only ones who would be indicted. So I don't think that, uh, the, the, that the announcement, the formal announcement on the 15th was in fact any news to us. When, when did you first learn of uh, Mr. Segretti's activities uh, and the possible role of Mr. Chapin in those activities? I think that was at the time that it first began to be talked about in the press. I had not heard of Segretti as an individual prior to that time. And then did you hold any meetings uh, to uh, involving that, that incident? Involving what incident? Mr. Chapin's role in the Segretti uh, uh, matter? There were a number of meetings to determine what the White House news position or, or press position should be on that, yes. And did you, as a result of those meetings, learn about Mr. Chapin's uh, role in, uh, with Mr. Segretti? Well, I'm not sure as I learned about them in those meetings as such, but I did, I did begin to learn more um, in the end of October and the first couple of weeks of November, yes. And uh, did you make any, uh, did you participate in the uh, preparation of the public statements concerning Mr. Chapin's role? Yes, I did. And uh, isn't it true that those, those statements did not, in effect, acknowledge Mr. Chapin's role in uh, either employing Mr. Segretti or uh, uh, having Mr. Segretti work for the campaign? You say did not, in effect, acknowledge? Did not acknowledge. Did not acknowledge? Well, I was under the impression that the that the uh, material that was being worked on, and you have an exhibit that I yes. think has my handwriting on it, uh, had a couple of depositions that were, or uh, affidavits that were proposed to be attached, which did make uh, rather uh, full and complete acknowledgement. Unfortunately, those were not those were not released, but that would have been the the form of release that I would have preferred. Was well, it your statement that you recommended that there be a full release of yes, Mr. Sir. Chapin's involvement? Yes, uh, sir. Now. Do you recall in September 1971 traveling with the president? I think you indicated you traveled with the president to Japan at that time. No, sir. When did, when did you go with the president to Japan? The president went to Hawaii to meet the Japanese prime minister in September. Is that what you mean? Well, yes. Yes, I did. Did you accompany him then? Yes, sir. Now, did you stop on your way at the Benson Hotel in Portland? We did some time, and I can't remember whether it was on that particular uh, that particular trip or not. My recollection is we went. Uh, let's see. No, we went right straight out and right straight back to Hawaii. Went out on the uh, went out on the 30th, direct to Hickam, and we came back from Hickam direct to El Toro on September 1. Uh, when, when, Mr. Ehrlichman, did you first become aware that Mr. Hunt was seeking executive clemency? I'm not sure that I was ever aware in the terms that you just framed your question that Hunt was seeking executive clemency in those, in those flat terms. When I became aware after Mr. Colson had had his conversation with Mr. Bittman that Mr. Bittman had attempted to open a conversation with Mr. Colson on that subject, which Mr. Colson says he refused to engage in. Now, that is as far as that ever went in behalf of Mr. Hunt, so far as I know. 
and you don't know of any assurances that Mr. Bittman or Mr. Hunt received uh, from Mr. Colson concerning uh, an executive clemency? Well, Mr. Colson stated to me precisely the opposite, that he had been very careful in not making any assurances to them. Now, I think the, uh, di the, your diary shows that you did meet with Mr. Colson and Mr. Dean on January the 3rd. Uh, then you met, you met with the President and Mr. Haldeman on January the 4th, and again with Mr. Dean and Mr. Colson on January the 5th. This is approximately the time that Mr. Dean has testified that the request uh, or the issue came up concerning Mr. Hunt's uh, desire for executive clemency, and that Mr. Colson and Mr. Dean, according to Mr. Dean's testimony, uh, spoke to you about it, and that you said, according to his testimony, that you would check uh, with the President and came out and said that uh, no commitment should be made, but that some assurance should be given to him. Uh, do you recall that? Not the testimony, recalling doing that. Doing what, Mr. Dash? Going, uh, being asked and by Mr. Colson and Mr. Dean uh, to raise the question of executive clemency for Hunt with the President. All right, stop right there. They didn't do that. Now go ahead. All right. That you're checking with the President whether or not it would be possible to give Mr. Hunt executive clemency. That, that would be on the 4th of January in the company of Dr. Kissinger and Mr. Haldeman. Is that right? Something around Pardon Something me. Around that. that meeting of, uh, at 302 on the 4th. Is that the meeting you're suggesting? Well, you met with the President a couple times during that period of time, but the 4th no, you did meet No, with I the didn't. President. As a matter of fact, I met with the President one time on the 4th at 302 in the company of Mr. Haldeman and Dr. Kissinger. Is that the time you're suggesting that I ask the President if we could give Hunt well, executive clemency? Did you meet with the President on the January the 5th? Not according to my records. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Dr. Kissinger and I had a 10-minute meeting with the President at 4.55 uh, on that day. Did you at any time meet with the President and discuss executive clemency? Yes. When? In July of 1972. Now, why in July of 1972? would you be discussing executive clemency with the President? Because it occurred to me, as an original proposition, that sooner or later somebody was going to raise this issue. And I thought it would be a very good idea to talk it through with the President before it came up in any specific context and find out exactly where we stood. Well, that time the indictments hadn't come down. That's correct. It was shortly after the break-in. Why would it even come to your mind that any of the defendants would have raised the question of executive clemency. Why? Because you had a you had a, a defendant who was an employee of the committee to reelect the president, and it seemed to me just uh, a, a very uh, natural thing that inferences would be raised at some time in the future. Well, did we you had a long we had a long walk on the beach on that particular day, and we we talked about a lot of subjects, and this was one of the subjects we talked about. Uh, had you had any discussion with Mr. Colson uh, or, uh, or Mr. Hunt uh, at that time about it? At that time? Yes. Not that I can recall. It seemed unlikely that you would. And, you, you, uh, you, you, and it just is uh, somewhat surprising that so early after the break-in, you would even be talking about executive clemency who, to the president. Who did, who did it surprise, Mr. Dash? I said it, it does seem surprising. To you? To me. Uh, that you, in July, shortly after the break-in, before any indictments, that you'll be discussing executive clemency, but that's your testimony that you did. Not only that, that's what happened. <laughs> now, and you never did after having any discussions with Mr. Dean later on in January. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first And you part. never again discussed that with the President after talking with Mr. Dean about, about executive clemency. Never again, no. I think that there were discussions in uh, March and April of this no, year about the allegations well, that Mr. Dean no, was I'm making. I'm back earlier to the January period because just before, actually to, to put the point uh, in time accurately, just before Mr. Hunt pleaded guilty is well, when Mr. Dean... Mr. Dean's, Mr. Dean's uh, original story was, of course, that I jumped up from the meeting and ran downstairs and popped into the Oval Office, which, of course, was nonsense. So then he contrived this other story, and neither one of them are true, Mr. Dash. Now, on February 10, uh, 1973, uh, you, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Dean, and Dick Moore did meet in La Costa, did you not? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, could you tell us what the purpose of that meeting was? Yes, that meeting was called because the president had asked who was handling the preparation of the White House case for the Senate Select Committee hearings and what planning was being done and what was the White House position going to be on matters like executive privilege. And uh, there were no answers to those questions. Um, we had just come uh, from the inaugural. Everybody had been very busily occupied uh, up to that point. And uh, uh, frankly, there wasn't anybody uh, uh, handling that. And so um, one of us, and I forget who, called uh, John Dean and asked him to come out and uh, sit down and, and talk through this whole subject of White House uh, response, so to speak, to the uh, uh, upcoming hearings of the Senate Select Committee. Well, did the discussion include just not only the White House response in general or, or executive privilege issues, or, but did it also include how, uh, what steps you might take in terms of uh, affecting the resolution authorizing this committee, what steps you might take in obtaining uh, a, a minority counsel that would be helpful, uh, an evaluation of members of the committee, as has been testified by Mr. Dean before this committee? Well, there were, it was a little bit like uh, uh, attorneys meeting before a trial to talk about the, the uh, uh, upcoming trial and what the selection of the jury would be like and the kinds of jurors that you would prefer to have in a case of this kind and uh, what opposing counsel was like and so on and so forth. It was, a, it was a sort of a general brainstorming session on the subject. And all those subjects that you mentioned came up as did a, a whole raft of other subjects uh, relating to these upcoming hearings. Now, are, are you aware of, then, what assignments were given to anybody to follow up on, on this discussion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Dean was given an assignment to attempt to prepare a general statement of Watergate in its broadest aspects, money, Segretti, planning and execution of the break-in, the widest kind of a preliminary statement, because it was decided that rather than to uh, uh, die by inches in terms of having questions asked and, and tiny bits of fact come out in answers through the process of the hearing, it would be much better if the entire story were laid out in a comprehensive statement in advance. So Mr. Dean was given that assignment. Uh, after uh, a number of hours of discussion, uh, it was sort of the consensus of the meeting that the best possible um, management um, uh, entity uh, would not be the White House or, or government people, but would be the committee to re-elect. And so uh, the thought was that the committee to re-elect, uh, with John Mitchell stepping back into the management of it, uh, would be an ideal uh, focal point for all kinds of um, uh, the, the various management problems associated with these hearings. And Dick Moore was going to go and talk to John Mitchell about this idea, I uh, heard the testimony about Dick Moore going up to talk to him about money. That had to do, as I recall, with a specific aspect of this. Uh, Mr. Dean raised the point that these defendants in the, in the break-in case, uh, many of them either had cases that were pending sentencing or were on appeal or in some kind of an interlocutory stage, and that they might have the right uh, to have their rights protected by seeking a judicial um, uh, delay of the committee hearings. Um, it was recognized in the course of passing that that was going to obviously require the services of attorneys, and those attorneys would have to be paid. And so that was, a, as, as Dick Moore testified, a, a rather passing subject, but nevertheless it was noticed as a money problem that could not be satisfied out of campaign funds, and that he should also talk to John Mitchell about that. Well, why, but why would... Um, um uh, you, Mr. Ehrlichman, and Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Dean, uh, with your positions at the White House, concern yourselves over the uh, criminal defense lawyer's uh, uh, case uh, that might have some impact on delaying this committee. Was it a strategy uh, issue? It was, a, it was in the nature of a strategy issue, and it was a passing strategy issue. I wouldn't want it to get out of proportion and no. have you focus on it as being sort of focus a on it. central strategy issue no. here. But it was, was really a very, very... Uh, a glancing blow or, or passing reference to an aspect of this, which Mr. Dean raised as a as a legitimate right. part of the strategy. Uh, well, I think question. taking it as, as a as a passing uh, blow or something, and not certainly a central theme. 
uh, it was considered as a strategy to keep this committee from uh, going forward with its hearings to well, uh, this this to, meeting to, covered uh, dilatory tactics it covered a, a wide variety of subjects including uh, 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 dilatory tactics but certainly not limited to them well what did you have to be afraid of sir what did you have to be afraid of well I think, it was, I think it was conceived that the um, uh, attack would be highly partisan that it would be uh, strongly anti-administration anti the president uh, senator Irvin was then believed to be a very partisan man and uh, i think there was there was strong concern that uh, this uh, whole process of this select committee would have worked to the serious disadvantage of the administration there was no uh, there was certainly no acceptance of the thought that uh, the undertaking was totally benign uh, this was on uh, february 10th the lacoste meeting we're talking about uh, then i, I take it uh, have you had an opportunity and I, and I don't want to take any time on it to see the agenda items that um, mr dean testified that later went into the president concerning uh, discussion with Senator Baker and uh, uh, on also minority council issues. Yes, I did. I think there, that the, the uh, suggestion that that somehow relates to the La Costa meeting is badly overdrawn and overemphasized. Oh, I think Mr. Haldeman is your, is your better witness on that, yes. but uh, from what I know, what took place at the La Costa meeting, um, the relationship between the two is, is much more tenuous than Mr. Dean attempted no, to No, I would draw. agree with you that Mr. Haldeman is, but I would be a follow-up of, of La Costa rather than La Costa. No, I, even that. I think uh, the proximate relationship is doubtful. By the way, let, let's go back briefly because we, um, to your, perhaps your diary um, is not as accurate as the White House log. Uh, on January 4, 1973, when you indicated that you perhaps wouldn't take up in the presence of Dr. Kissinger the issue of executive clemency, um, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. I just asked you if that's the you meeting you were question. relating to. Uh, on the 4th, 4th uh, of January, 1973, does your diary show that uh, you met with the President from 3.02 p.m. to 4.44 p.m., and that you were with Mr. Haldeman in that meeting from 3.02 to 4.44, which is the full period, uh, Mr. Collins from 3.04 to 3.05, and 418 to 449, and Mr. Kissing, Dr. Kissinger, 430 to 515. So you well, should... I don't have all those refinements in my diary, but I show that Mr. Uh, Dr. Kissinger was in the meeting I was in for approximately 45 minutes of a total of about an hour and 40 minutes, something of that kind. There was a time when you were with the President and Mr. Haldeman uh, and yourself alone. I assume so. Uh, now, in March 1973, did, uh, did you become aware, and I think you testified that you did, of the increased demands for Hunt for Money, so-called Hunt's blackmail? Well, I wouldn't use the word increased because I think um, I didn't have any frame of reference in, in which to, to uh, identify this as an increase. I certainly am well, familiar demand, with the blackmail. Of a demand, the blackmail. Uh, who informed you of this? Mr. Dean. And... Uh, did you raise, did it raise a question in your mind at least at this time that of the, again, having recalled that money was paid uh, for defense of the propriety of paying this money when such a demand was being made? Oh, certainly. Well, now, let me separate out all of the, the testimony that you just inserted in that question, and maybe you could restate the question without all the embellishments. Well, just the uh, same question. You, you, had, you had found nothing wrong, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just beforehand, on the February 10th meeting, again had discussed making certain payments uh, or to, uh, going up to Mitchell, having Mr. Moore go see Mr. Mitchell about raising some funds for the defendants. And now in March 1973, sometime in March, uh, you become aware of a demand. Mr. Hunt, what you just called well, blackmail. The difference between the two is dramatic. There is no suggestion at La Costa that any money be paid in consideration of anybody's silence. Or, or anything of that kind. The money we were talking about at La Costa was to compensate attorneys who would file motions in behalf of the defendants. And as far as I'm concerned, that's, that would have been a, a completely uh, legitimate undertaking, uh, uh, privately raised funds for that purpose. Well, back this was a, a flat-out blackmail attempt. Uh, if money was not paid, then Hunt would say so-and-so, but if money were paid, he would not say so-and-so. That's the first time I encountered anything of that sort in this entire, um, what would that be, uh, 10 months. 
Well, uh, were you aware that back in November, uh, Mr. Hunt had a telephone conversation with Mr. Colson, and Mr. Colson taped that conversation uh, with regard to Mr. Hunt's uh, uh, wanting money and wanting to uh, being very unhappy that he wasn't getting the kind of money he was. Well, now I've heard testimony about that, and that I'm supposed to have heard that yes, tape. Yes. Did you hear that tape? I don't recall ever hearing that tape. Uh, uh, I recall Mr. Dean coming to Camp David on one occasion during the two months we were up there. We've repeatedly, since he testified to that effect, we've repeatedly tried to get a transcript or a copy of that tape without success from your staff. But I would certainly like to see it because have I, you I just this? draw a blank. I, I don't, Mr. Wilson, have you requested the Even copy of this? I, uh, Mr. Strickler, asked Mr. Hamilton for it. Well, Mr. Hamilton can answer. Well, in any event, the answer to your question is that I just, I just really draw a blank on that. It doesn't, it, it doesn't relate to anything that I can recall. Well, may we have it now? Yes. Uh, Good. Uh, I have a copy, and if someone will take it for you to re uh, peruse it, maybe it'll either refresh your recollection wall. If it does, I'd like you to respond. If it doesn't, you can't respond. Fine. May we keep this? That's my only copy. Sir? It's my only copy, but I'll make a Xerox copy for you. While John Ehrlichman, as attorneys, examined the script of the Colson conversation with Howard Hunt, we're going to take a short break. Public television's coverage of the Senate hearings will continue after a pause for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the Public Broadcasting Service. From Washington, NPACT continues its coverage of hearings by the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. Here again, correspondent Robert McNeil. 
As we go back to the hearings, Chief Counsel Sam Dash has asked John Ehrlichman if he'd heard the recording of a conversation between Howard Hunt and Charles Colson. Counsel, I don't recall ever either seeing this transcript I or, Wilson, or like hearing this. That? Please. Yes. If you could return it, we'll see that you do get a copy. In. Uh, you, you, you stated a little earlier, prior to my showing you that document, uh, that, this, that Mr. Hunt was making a demand, either I get so much money or I'll tell this or that. What, what conceivably could Mr. Hunt have told? The way John Dean explained it to me, the threat was in terms of he would tell seamy things about what he did at the White House for Mr. Krogh and me. Now, I took that to refer to the, the California break-in, uh, which is the only thing I could think of that, would, uh, uh, that he ever did at the White House for me that, uh, of any kind, for that matter. Now, uh, uh, and I asked, I asked Mr. Dean uh, if he knew what this was about, and he said he assumed that that's what it was about. Now, did you, uh, did you recall a meeting with Mr. Dean and with, the, with Mr. Mitchell, I think uh, March 22nd probably would be the date, uh, where did, they, did you ask Mr. Mitchell whether or not uh, Hunt's demands had been taken care of? Uh, I heard that testified, and point of fact, my recollection of that is that that conversation was between Mr. Dean and Mr. Mitchell, and it was Mr. Dean saying, just, is that matter taken care of without reference to Hunt or anybody, and Mr. Mitchell sort of grunting and saying, uh, maybe, or I guess so, or something very vague. Did you learn about that time? Uh, that, in fact, Mr. Hunt's demands had been taken care of? No. In fact, it wasn't until the testimony here that I was aware of that. And did you have any, uh, any knowledge or awareness of Mr. Fred LaRue's role no. in, in making those payments? Uh, did you, by the way, tell the President concerning at least the blackmail demand? Uh, by the time I discussed it with him, he already knew of it. Now, it appears from certainly the White House logs that we have received that after the LaCosta meeting, uh, sometime after February 10, uh, Mr. Le uh, Mr. Dean's uh, meetings with the President uh, increased uh, really significantly because he had very few meetings prior to that time, and then they were quite frequent after. Could you explain, to your knowledge if you had, uh, why that occurred? Yes, sir. I think I can. Uh, at our next joint meeting, Mr. Haldeman's and mine, with the President, uh, he said, well, how did, the, how did the weekend go, or words to that effect, and when can I expect that statement, meaning this broad statement uh, that Mr. Dean was to prepare? Uh, one of us, and I think it was I, said, I don't think you're going to get that statement. And uh, he said, why not? And I said, well, John Dean has a lot of reasons why. Uh, such a statement should not be released. And they related to the rights of defendants and to the civil suit that was pending and to the problems of executive privilege and so on. And the President expressed considerable impatience and began to lean on me pretty hard. And I said, well, Mr. President, I'm in the middle on this, and I would be very grateful if you would have a personal conversation with John Dean about these problems so that you would get a first-hand feel for the objections that he is raising to the request that you've been making. And he said, all right, I'll do that. And it was very soon after returning to uh, Washington uh, that he, that I have a note in one of, one of my meetings with him, that he wanted to see John Dean immediately that day. And he did, and that was the first meeting of this series. Uh, but I think it was uh, and, and about that same time, uh, the President said, I want you to stay out of this to me. Uh, he got me started on a massive so-called surrogate operation of sending the Cabinet and administration people into the country on questions of impoundment and, and uh, overspending and budget cuts and things of that kind. And uh, I have very explicit instructions in my notes to, uh, to the effect that I am to uh, discontinue any further devotion of time to the whole Watergate subject. The dean has it, that the president is satisfied that he's in charge, and, and from that point forward, I'm out of it.
Well, did you or anybody in your presence uh, ever recommend to the President that it might be a good idea to have a number of meetings with Mr. Dean if executive privilege was going to be raised with regard to Mr. Dean's appearance? You mean attorney-client privilege? Well, or executive privilege. No. Uh, that, this, that prior to that time, uh, was, this came up during the Gray hearings, and the issue of Mr. Dean uh, being uh, subpoenaed down or invited down, uh, that uh, the question would be that uh, if he didn't meet with the President very much, whether there could be very much executive privilege or attorney-client privilege. And to your knowledge, I'm only asking whether or not either you advise the President or in your presence anybody advise the President, that that would be a... You'll remember, uh, Mr. Dash, that I testified that when I first got into this matter on the 30th of March again, that one of the great remaining open questions was this whole business of how attorney-client privilege worked vis-a-vis uh, -vis the President and counsel to the President. And I had to call for a lot of uh, briefing on that. It was still an open question, but I was not well versed in the subject prior to that time and uh, relied entirely on Mr. Dean uh, to preserve that relationship in whatever way it should be preserved. I know we've had the testimony to... from Mr. Dean. Mr. Yes. Dash, may I interrupt you a moment to address the chair? Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> again on the question of scheduling, it's obvious that uh, the examination of Mr. Ehrlichman will not be completed as we had hoped in time. And I want to mention again that Mr. Haldeman's statement will require at least two hours to read. I wouldn't like him to start it this afternoon and not complete it. Uh, if Mr. Dash, and I don't want to limit Mr. Dash, if he goes for another hour, could I either have the assurance of the committee that uh, Mr. Haldeman uh, could read his whole statement before we recess this evening, or that we will begin in the morning. Mr. Dash has just assured me that uh, he has only about 15 minutes more than be a question. The other uh, interrogator be Mr. Thompson. And um, I'm about finished. We, we can certainly complete a statement uh, today. I was committed to decide this morning to start the meeting at 9 30 in the morning and run till 5 or 5 30 and uh, even uh, to expedite these things because I think the country would like to get uh, the investigations over in particular this phase. I'd be in favor and, of some uh, night, night meetings. Well, uh, we'll certainly see that Mr. Holloman gets to read his entire statement without uh, uh, today. Yeah. And I hope that we can complete. Uh, the examination uh, more, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I'm just a little tempted to say that confess that at the time Mr. Erdogan was testifying about a while ago, I'm sorry the conclusion was drawn that I was sort of partisan. I was partisan to the Constitution because I was fighting for the, the congressional view in respect to impoundment and also for the idea that the Constitution requires a confirmation of such important offices as direct and direct and deputy director of the Office of Management and the Budget. And I was also calling attention about that time to the fact the Supreme Court had held that when witnesses were subpoenaed to appear before a congressional committee, if they didn't appear, they could be arrested and brought before the Senate. And uh, that was in direct opposition to the theory that uh, there was an executive privilege that entitled a uh, a, a former or present White House employee or aide from the parent before in the Congressional Committee, and I'm sorry that uh, that caused the feeling that I was sort of uh, partisan, because I doubt whether there's a Democrat in the Senate that voted more to stay in the President's position on economic issues and on uh, war issues, and just the other day I voted against the War Powers Bill because I thought it encroached on the constitutional domain of the President. Excuse the interruption. No, we'll, we'll finish it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it, 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 it ought to be noted that that time will be deducted from counsel's time. I think we've had testimony on the March 21st meeting with Mr. Dean. Uh, and Mr. Dean testified that he gave the, a full story to the President. Uh, concerning who might be involved uh, and that in the Watergate, uh, either in the break-in or the cover-up, and that you did have an afternoon meeting with Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Dean, uh, and the President on the 21st. Mr. Dean's testimony is that at that, that afternoon meeting, uh, he stated 
uh, both to you and Mr. Haldeman, that all three of you, Mr. Dean, Mr. Haldeman, and Mr. Ehrlichman, were indictable. Uh, did Mr. Dean so, uh, so uh, state the I have I have no recollection at all, Mr. Dash, of that, that being said at that time. As a matter of fact, it was um, several weeks after that before we had a conversation with Mr. Dean in which uh, he finally alluded to my uh, relationship with Mr. Kambach as presenting some embarrassment to me, but certainly uh, uh, nothing that would be indictable. But uh, back on the 21st of March, uh, I don't believe that Mr. Dean's theory of the case had crystallized yet. Well, uh, you, of course, on March 22nd, I think you've always testified, you met with the President, Mr. Holden, Mr. Dean, Mr. Mitchell, yes. and I think your view of it was that if the President knew anything at that time, he was, uh, your, your guess was that he probably was not letting it out. Uh, because he was still in the midst of his investigation. Because it appears from your testimony, Mr. Mitchell's testimony, Mr. Dean's testimony, that Mr. the President did not confront any of the parties at that meeting with any of the charges. Is That's that correct. That's correct. Now, now that, that, that is correct without adopting all of the preceding 11 sentences in your question. Well, I took your, your, your testimony. Well, I know you paraphrased, but right. you, and I do not adopt your paraphrase. All right. Let the record stand as to what, what as was the actual testimony. On March 28, uh, you called Mr. Kleindienst. Now, if in fact, now certainly on March 21st, let me go back to March 21st, the President, the President has referred in his May 22nd and I think in, May in his April 17th uh, uh, statement that he learned new facts, serious facts. Charges, on, I believe he said. Charges is charges the word. On March 21st. And uh, Mr. Dean has testified as to what, at least so far as he was concerned, what charges he made. Uh, now, you weren't at that meeting, uh, to be sure, on March 21st. And yet, when you called uh, Mr. Kleindienst, you stated in that call uh, that the President said to me to say to you that the best information he had and has in this is neither Dean nor Haldeman nor Colson nor I nor anybody in the White House had any prior knowledge of the burglary. Uh, he said he, well, then he went on, and that you were going to, if he was to give you to give more information. Now, uh, I take it that if the President had received information uh, from Mr. Uh, Dean, uh, that, for instance, say Mr. Strawner himself had information on March 21st, he would not be instructing you to call Mr. Kleindienst uh, to, to give that message, would he? <laughs> well, uh, I, I certainly. I'm not going to respond to that question, Mr. Dash. It involves your own personal hypothesis, and it invites me to join you in it, which I'm not willing to do. I've stated what my hypothesis is with regard to the President's conduct after March 21st, and uh, I, I don't happen to agree with yours. Well, I take it perhaps maybe the best evidence of what occurred on March 21st between Mr. Dean and Mr. President might be the tapes that recorded that conversation. Or someone else who was present. Now, like Mr. Holden, no, we would still have the tapes also that might corroborate that uh, discussion. Uh, now, did you, uh, did, did, did Mr. Dean ever show you a list, a handwritten list actually on his part that he'd made up after he'd gone to the prosecutors, in which he had listed various people who he claimed based on information he was getting from the prosecutors and information he was giving to the prosecutors would be indictable or were, uh, uh, for criminal charges. Is that this exhibit that you have in yes, your... Yes, exhibit. Uh, um, no, he never, he never showed that to me. Did he ever me. show you that? No. Uh, he has so testified that he did, and I guess that, again, he would say would be untrue on his part. That's correct. You, you've also testified that you were asked to make an inquiry on March 30th by the President. I think yes. that inquiry is what it was, and that you reported to the President on April the 14th. Yes. And the President came out with a statement on April the 17th. Now, in between that time, on the 15th of April, were you aware of the fact that Mr. Kleindienst and Mr. Peterson met with the President and reported fully to the President as to what 
information they were getting in the grand jury investigation? Well, I precipitated that meeting, yes, Mr. Dash. How did you precipitate it? By calling Mr. Kleindienst at 515 on the afternoon of the 14th at the President's request and advising him of my uh, report to the President that morning and also of my interviews with Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Magruder. Then, uh, after that call, as you know, the Attorney General had an all-night meeting with his U.S. Attorney and his prosecuting attorneys. Uh, he then made arrangements to see the President after church on the, on the morning of the 15th. And would you say that actually the President's uh, statement on April 17th was uh, based uh, on the meeting with Mr. Kleindienst and with uh, Mr. Peterson? You mean exclusively? Not exclusively, but to a large part. How large? Well, all right, you're, you have testified uh, frequently uh, to uh, questions put to you concerning your inquiry, and you've uh, indicated that you wouldn't call it an investigation. Well, I'm very modest about it because right. I, don't, uh, I don't consider it to be a total investigation. Right. And, in as you said, and you said it was hearsay on hearsay, and different people were coming in, and you were taking notes. Mr. Kleindien and Mr. Peterson, at least, were able to give the President a fairly co complete report on what they were getting in the grand jury, which was both testimony under oath, probably, and also information information they were getting uh, from the prosecutors. Well, so as, I, as I testified, I think, to Senator Montoya's question, there were really a number of converging lines at this point, and I certainly didn't intend, and as a matter of fact, I hope I expressly disclaimed any credit for cracking the case or anything of that kind. But you had the grand jury effort. You had the, the uh, uh, prosecuting attorneys working along with the grand jury. On the one hand, you had the Department of Justice effort, and then you had this this sort of subsidiary inquiry that I was making, all of which contributed to the President's fund of knowledge on this subject. Now, uh, the, the statement on the 17th was not intended by any means to cap it. Uh, the inquiry went on after that. And so um, uh, I think you have to see this as a convergence of a number of different efforts uh, that, that finally uh, uh, has brought this thing into the open. And I think you've testified that you, uh, that you participated in the preparation of that statement of the yes, 17th. Sir. Uh, by the way, did you, uh, although you had left the White House, did you participate in any way in the uh, statement of May 22nd of the president? No. By the way, Mr. Ehrlichman, have you ever received, either directly or indirectly, since the 1st of January 1969, any campaign funds for any purpose? Any campaign funds for any purpose? I had some expenses reimbursed at the... Uh, at the uh, convention, uh, which were not legitimate government expenses and which were reimbursed to me by the committee to reelect. And I've forgotten what those were. They were quite nominal, as I recall. They were nominal? Yes. Would that be the extent, the extent of it? Well, uh, it, it is possible that I was still receiving reimbursement of expenses from the 68 campaign in January 69. I'm not, I'm not prepared to say uh, without. But if know, so, would that would that be a nominal amount or would it be a large? No, amount? it would be. I would think fairly extensive because uh, uh, at that time I was the the you know in the 68 campaign I was the tour director and and uh, I was racking up a fair amount of personal expenses in that in that process. I'm not asking But uh, I'm, I'm just not uh, able to recall whether those kept coming in that late or not. Uh, they were pretty slow. Yeah. No, I'm just uh, talking about after the 68 campaign, uh, 69 thereafter. Not, I'm not well, asking I, I say, they were... They... Mr. Chairman, I want to raise a question of relevancy with respect to this date that Mr. Badash is relying upon. Uh, may I say with great respect, I think your resolution does not reach this far, sir. I don't, I don't think the resolution reaches anything that uh, except the uh, presidential election of 1972 and uh, any campaigns which preceded that which were relevant to the selection of candidates to run in 1972. Which would be the primaries. Yes, yes. well, be the primaries, all the campaigns of the candidates prior to the primary. I don't think it would reach 1969. Yeah, well, it would, it would, well, the day after the 68 election, if the funds 
that were received in 69 were funds used for the 1972 campaign, because the campaign began the day after the 1968 election. Well, that wasn't your question, but I, I said, want to address myself to that question also. That, oh. I asked, all I asked was, and I, I think I received an answer, whether or not uh, from 1969 onward, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman received any campaign funds. Well, I, well, I, I say don't that. believe we can go back now. If he received any funds that were collected in 1968 campaign that were turned over to the committee for, uh, for use in 1970, I think that would be valid, but... Uh, yeah, we've been going into that. Well, let the question include uh, that, that premise then, sir. Well, the way the question is asked, it's well, simply... Well, I frankly uh, don't think that uh, what he received in 1969 would be or, yeah. or within then, the purview of our resolution. You and I agree that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, there's one other point, and I don't mean to belabor it since the chair has already ruled, but if there is information that the staff has on some aspect of the matter in that respect, I understand it has not been brought to the attention of the minority, so I'd like to request that the majority staff might do that before they pursue the question. I'm not, I'm not I'm pursuing the question any further. I just asked the question. Could I be sure? Well, that? Mr. Dash, I, I reiterate my request, yes. and I'm sure the chairman will agree that the understanding is that the information will be equally shared. Oh, so yes. if there is a point, I'd like to have it. In other words, my, my tentative ruling, unless it's upset to the committee, is that we have no jurisdiction to investigate anything connected with campaign funds uh, which uh, were left over from the other uh, 68 election unless those funds were used in connection with the, uh, the 72 election. The chair, the chair has ruled, and I agree with him for whatever not, that's worth, and I think we ought to go ahead. Right. Uh, now, in preparation for your testimony, Mr. Ehrlichman, have you had access for your records at the uh, White House? Uh, it's what I suppose you would call limited access. Um, I can go in and look at records. Uh, but I can't copy, I can't take notes, um, and uh, I, I'm not allowed to take them from the room. How long uh, did you stay in the White House after April 30 when uh, you tendered your resignation? About uh, two and a half weeks. Did you have access at that time to your records? Yes, I did. I had, um, well, at some no, ex excuse me. I did not have I did not have custody of my records at that time. My my custody ceased on the 30th of April, uh, so that then I was subject to the the limitations, uh, which were then imposed by the uh, office of the counsel there from from that day forward. Um, I I literally physically gave up custody and and possession of the records on the 30th of, of April. Now. Um Based on the President's latest statement concerning our uh, efforts to get what might be relevant documents that are not covered by executive privilege uh, as considered by the President, that we would have to ask for it specifically and describe the record specifically, would you be willing to assist the Committee uh, in identifying certain of your records still in the White House which we might feel necessary to ask for by description and with specificity? I'd want to take counsel on that before I responded to that, counsel. Right. Now, have you, prior to your testimony uh, before this committee, discussed your testimony with Mr. Haldeman? Discussed my testimony with him? Yes. You mean how I was going to answer questions? Yes. No, we've discussed the subject matter very extensively, but I've not discussed my testimony. Well, in other words, you discussed the subject matter of your answers, but not the testimony as not such. Not the subject matter of my answers. The subject matter that's at, at issue here, I have discussed with him. Uh, both during and since. Mr. Dash, well, Mr. Chairman, I, I may, think may I ask Mr. May, would you permit Mr. Ehrlichman to describe how the preparation for this hearing was pursued and the preparation of their individual statements? Yes, if point. he wishes to make a statement on that. Yes, because that, that's my last question, and if he wants to finish with that, I have no further questions. Well, as you know, uh, several Several weeks ago, I would imagine five weeks ago or so, Mr. Haldeman moved. I have not seen him to consult uh, since then, except for perhaps a total of you know, 20, 30 minutes maximum. Uh, my opening statement in this matter was prepared personally 
and without any consultation with Mr. Haldeman, as I assume his was, because I've certainly not had any consultation with him on his. I have spent virtually every day since my uh, termination at the White House, uh, two and a half weeks after the 30th, in attempting to get straight uh, the dates, the places, the times, the person's presence, the subject matters covered, and to go back into the White House records and, and take a look at my records to try and refresh my recollection as to what has taken place uh, in, the, in the premises. Um, from time to time, uh, prior to his departure, Mr. Haldeman and I have discussed aspects of this matter, but certainly not in terms of testimony here, only in terms of what actually took place in that research effort. Well, I, I, I take it that uh, those times you did discuss it, it was in anticipation of both of you appearing before this committee. Mr. Dash, you are not the only girl in town. There are lots of other inquiries going right. on. Anticipation of testimony uh, to all the other girls. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I believe Senator Wacker has a, a question on this very point, so I'd like to yield to him at this time. Thank you very much. Mr. Ehrlichman, do you assume that your testimony is in complete accord with that of Mr. Haldeman when he appears before this committee, and that there exists no conflict between both of you with regard to all the events this committee has covered? No, I don't assume that, Senator. Well, under those circumstances, may I ask then how it's possible that you're both being represented by the same attorney? Isn't this a potential conflict of interest in the event that Mr. Haldeman disagrees with your recollection of the events in question? Mr. Chairman, may I answer that question? I'm, I'm the one who is the subject of that question, and I'd like to answer it for I'd Mr. Like to, I'd like to hear the answer, because I, I think Mr. Ehrlichman's answer is quite clear. There is the potential of a conflict between the two of them. There's no really co uh, potential conflict at all. I don't understand. Your client has answered that there, that there is. That's what's his answer. I don't assume that there is a coincidence. Mr. Senator, wait, wait, let, me, let me say something to you, sir. To suggest that I'm involved in a matter where there is a conflict between two clients is the same as to suggest to me I'm that sensitive that I'm guilty of some fraud when I sit here. I would, have, I would have the clerk reread the question that I asked to Mr. Ehrlichman and have Mr. Ehrlichman's response to my question. assumption on that. In other words, uh, I repeat may again, I the, same question now? I, the same question I, your client answered. He said no. In other words, that there possibly could be a conflict. Oh, no. No, he no, didn't I, I say that I, at all. I did not. I said I made no assumption. That was the question you asked me. In other words, that it could be in conflict. No, there I could said could be no conflict that I'm aware of, sir. I'm not, I asked your client the question. No, because you are assailing my integrity. I am not assailing your integrity. I am questioning your client. I question well, Let me get an answer from him again. Let me ask him the same question. Do you assume that your testimony is in complete accord with that of Mr. Haldeman when he appears before this committee? I make no assumption, Senator. I have no way of knowing uh, whether his testimony is going to coincide with mine or not. So that it is possible that there would be a conflict? I say there isn't. I'm asking your I <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking, Mr. so it is possible no, that there would the, be a conflict. We're the, we're the ones. Mr. Wilson, now, I, no, I the think. Senator, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, you, you parliamentarians have a phrase that I want to use. I want to rise to a point of personal privilege. Well, uh, I'm a very things, sensitive person about this, and I don't uh, want Mr. Senator White or anybody else to insinuate that I'm representing two clients who have conflicts. Now, Mr. Strickler and I know definitely there's no conflict between these two gentlemen. I want to say also that I that that the I was I was proceeding on the theory that Senator Weicker was merely addressing this, this particular question 
to uh, your client and not to you. Now, he did address one question to you, and you denied there was any conflict of interest, and I don't believe that this is a matter that the committee ought to pursue as to the conflict of interest of lawyers. Thank you. I, otherwise, I'd like to speak for about a half hour. <laughs> in other words, in other words, Mr. Ehrlichman, no, no, there I'm is no conflict. No, I, I, there is okay. no con I'm asking your client, not you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Ehrlichman, in other words, there will, there is no conflict between your testimony and the testimony Mr. of Mr. Hall. I, you told me uh, earlier that you well, couldn't control your... Well, wait a minute. Uh, 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 let, the, let Senator Weicker complete his question, including putting a question mark after it. <laughs> where, where, where does that leave me? Well, well, we'll let your client answer first, and then if you want to address the statement to the chair, will, well, I'll be I glad will, to great, receive it. great length. Go ahead, Senator Weicker, ask my client the question. <laughs> that there exists, I'm asking you the question as to whether or not there exists or could, ex or could exist conflict between both of you, you and Mr. Haldeman, with regards to the events that this committee has covered as far as testimony is concerned. Or let me repeat the question right from the outset, again from the, uh, uh, from the, from the clerk's tape, but I've got it in front of me. Do you assume that your testimony is in complete accord with that of Mr. Haldeman? Well, uh, Senator, I don't like to make rules on questions, but I don't see how the witness can possibly answer that until Mr. Haldeman testifies. But unless he has talked to Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Chairman. Oh, yes, you can ask the witness, be quite confident to ask the witness. He and Hall Mr. Haldeman have got together and uh, compared notes and agreed uh, to testify in like manner, or whether they got to have the witness consulted Mr. Haldeman for the purposes of refreshing his recollection about matters. You can go into that whole uh, area. Uh, but I, I just think you can't, uh, if Mr. Haldeman testifies, I don't believe the witness can, could uh, say whether his testimony conflicts with Mr. Haldeman's testimony, which has not yet been given. But, but you can certainly ask them whether or not they got together. And I am satisfied. And uh, agreed on what testimony they're going to give. I'll be glad to ask that, although I must confess that I am completely satisfied with the statement made by counsel that there is no conflict between the testimony of Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman. I say that without qualification. On the basis of more years of practice of law than any one of you sitting on that committee, including the chairman. That there is no conflict between the testimony of Mr. Haldeman and Mr. Ehrlichman. Well, I think you're operating here uh, on, on well, really two Mr. levels I of inquiry. And I'll have to admit, I think we lawyers do it sometimes to get a Require some little prophetic power as to what our clients are going to testify. <laughs> well, of course, we we know what we know what the two are yeah. going to testify yeah. to, and we're not aware of any material conflict. I mean, there may be a little variance in an incident, just like two people seeing an accident on the street, but there is no material conflict, yeah. in my knowledge. I give you my professional assurance of that. That, an that, that answers my question. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I don't think there's any way that uh, I can pursue uh, a couple of lines of questions I had in mind and still get on with the business at hand as we all want to. So uh, I'll forego any questions of Mr. Erdman at this time. I, I would like to say this, and I don't know whether it's appropriate, but I feel compelled to say this. That I'm a lawyer and I'm used to courtroom procedure. and. This witness has been the subject of moans and groans from the audience, and hisses, applause, sustained applause on some occasions and other demonstrations. And as far as I know, he's the only witness that's been subjected to all of these things. I think it's unfair to the witness. I don't think it does the work of this committee any good. It's not that you, Mr. Ehrlichman, are to be treated any better than any other witness, but you shouldn't be treated any worse doesn't go to the weight of your testimony or its credibility or whether we believe it or not, but I think it just goes to a matter of, of common decency and courtesy, which all witnesses are entitled to. I think that situation has been rectified now, at least I hope it is, and I just wanted to state that I, for the last few days of testimony, have regretted this situation and find it personally embarrassing. Thank you. Are there other questions of this witness? 
Mr. Vice Chairman, I uh, think under the rules I'm entitled to make a brief closing statement, and I'd you, like to avail myself of that privilege. If you I are indeed, and you time. may proceed, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the committee, I prepared for this hearing with just two objectives. First, to state the truth as nearly as recollection and research could enable me to do, and thereby to establish the falsity of the charges made against me by your star witness. For nearly five days, I have submitted to your cross-examination to permit a test of the truth of my testimony. In my opening statement, I listed a number of questions which I asked you to inquire about because I believe they are central to this matter and because I have some information about them. In the past five days, a great deal of time has been spent mostly on a few of them. As a result, there is now remaining one matter which uh, I believe is important enough to uh, mention in passing to the committee. Uh, I did not have an opportunity to review with the committee uh, my notes of my second interview with Gordon Strong. I think it is important to the committee to know that as you read those notes, the question which I continually put to Mr. Strong all the way through was, is there anything else? Are you giving me the whole list? Are these all the people in the White House who are involved? And have you told me everything you know about their involvement? In other words, the list you see in the Strawn notes is intended, as I recall the interview with Mr. Strawn, to be an exclusive list. And uh, that does not appear on the face of the notes, and I think it's important for you to have that. My secondary objective here was to be prepared to raise a voice for the President who is unrepresented here. As your questions developed, I had no opportunity to do so as his advocate. I only shed some light on facts which disproved a few of the false allegations which have been advanced against him here. I do not apologize for my loyalty to the President any more than I apologize for my love of this country. I only hope that my testimony here has somehow served them both. I could not close without commenting on Gordon Strawn's answer of the other day to the question, do you have any advice for the young Americans who are expressing their disenchantment with government and the political process? Gordon said, stay away, and your gallery laughed. But I don't think many other Americans laughed at that answer. I certainly didn't, nor do I agree with Gordon's advice. Our political system and our real governmental institutions are not just the buildings and the laws and the traditions that one sees here in the city of Washington. Our government and our politics are only as idealistic, as honest as the people in those buildings who administer the laws and run the campaigns and fulfill the traditions. If some young Americans know that their ideals or ideas or motives are sounder or purer than those of the people now in politics or government, and I think Gordon should have said to them, come and do better. Don't stay away. Somehow in politics and government, it seems that there's always someone to fill the job. If you don't take it, you can be sure that somebody else will. We are either going to have highly motivated, able people running the political campaigns and filling the offices in government, or we will surely have seat warmers and hacks who will fill these places, and the country will be the worse for it. People must be attracted who will come here to fight for what they believe in and to work long hours to get things done. I hope good young people don't stay away. I hope they come here and apply their idealism and their enthusiasm and their high moral principles. I hope they come and test their ideas and their convictions in this marketplace. I hope they do come and do better. But young Americans, if you come here, come with your eyes wide open. If you go to work for the president and the executive branch, there are very few in the Congress or the media that are going to throw rosebuds at you. If you favor change in what our government is and what it does in our society, you'll have to fight for it. No such change has been won here by default, at least not recently. And be prepared to defend your sense of values when you come here, too. You'll encounter a local culture which scoffs at patriotism and family life and morality just as it adulates the opposite. And you'll find some people who've fallen for that line. 
But you'll also find in politics and government many great people who know that a pearl of great price is not had for the asking and who feel that this country and its heritage are worth the work, the abuse, the struggle, and the sacrifices. Don't stay away. Come and join them and do it better. Mr. Vice Chairman, this select committee has an awesome responsibility to find the truth. Such a search cannot be made by one whose eyes are clouded with preconception or partisanship. It can only be found by those with open minds, free of bias and unfairness. I am confident that the truth is there to be seen. It only needs the seers. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Mr. Ehrlichman, thank you very much. As with other witnesses, I express the gratitude of the committee for your appearance and testimony. I'm sure that you understand, as other witnesses do. The functions of this committee are manifold but that one of the functions of this committee is to develop what I've referred to as a definitive statement on Watergate and the other matters that were mandated to us by the Senate to inquire into. We will take your testimony. We will weigh it against the testimony given us by other witnesses, against circumstance, against documentation, and against whatever relevant information we can find in order to arrive at the truth. As I've also indicated, as the Chairman has indicated from time to time, we are not here to with defendants. We are going to find no one guilty or innocent of specified crimes, but we are going to try to find what happened, when, and who, who knew about it. You've given us a great volume of information, and we thank you for it. If I may take the brief privilege of adding an addendum to your advice to young people. I, too, was concerned about Mr. Strom's advice. I feel, for instance, that I feel very certain that one of the gravest consequences of Watergate, so-called, or of these hearings, would be that young people drop out, or that the citizens of America are disillusioned and drop out of the political system. I very much hope they drop in, and that at the next and succeeding elections, we have more people participating in the elective process than we've ever had before. Because truly and surely, the, ele the, the system of government of the United States is examining itself and that's a proof of its strength and not of its weakness. Are there other questions of this witness? Thank you very much. Would counsel call the next witness, please? Mr. Ra uh, Mr. Holliman, and we understand, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, that uh, the statement is just coming up now. It, uh, it was given to us yesterday evening, and we were just able to start reproducing it. And we have part of it on its way. And We'll, would you prefer to have a recess? Sir? Perhaps, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you could call a short recess, we'll have the, the statement. In here. the light of that situation and in light of the fact that the chairman has not yet returned from the last roll call vote, the committee will stand in brief recess subject to the call of the chair. While the committee shifts its focus from the president's number two aide to his number one man, we're going to take a short pause. Public television's coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings will continue after this break for station identification. Unabridged coverage of these hearings is provided as a public service by the member stations of PBS, the public broadcasting service. <laughs> 